<laughs> nice dude what's dude, up daniel what's up not much dude just uh you know busy day busy working nice painting away how are you dude i like your hat thank you i can't believe we like we just ended up doing this out of the blue just, i had no i had no clue you had the same hat as me and then it's one of those days where i was like you know what it was a beautiful sunny day i had it in the closet i was like i'm gonna wear it maybe you won't think anything of it and then you got the same hat unbelievable i couldn't believe it yeah you look great you look great dude you look good oh two two uh so what are you up to you uh you're recording some live action stuff how do you know that you told me <laughs> i just yeah. use my, my wizard powers and <laughs> you read my mind <laughs> i thought i closed those gates i locked them up but yeah so uh, i'm actually recording a live action in a couple of weeks it's going to be pretty crazy we're making a short film about these yakuza's who are looking for a missing dog and um i decided to do it because i just i was so tired of looking for work and finding a job and that whole process and working and being a concept artist and and working for an art director i didn't like or care about or working on a vision that sucked like i don't want to do that anymore so I just decided to direct my own movie and make my own movies. So I was like, I'm just going to do that um, and not have to worry about, you know, whether it's going to come out great, whether it's going to come out amazing, whether it's going to, the vision's going to fulfill itself and whether my concepts will happen. Why not just, you know, be the head of everything, get a producer, build a team. And so what I did was I started working on sets, physical sets being a lighting artist and then I just recruited everybody wrote a script built storyboards built a shot list um talked to a lot of people did a lot of things and then now we're here we're making a movie so it was a lot easier than I thought actually and also a lot harder than I thought but um it's crazy how many people will come together for so little to work on a good idea so it's very inspiring and it's uh a very bright future ahead, hopefully. So, yeah, that was that was it. That's awesome. What about you? Um, I'm on Spider Verse three, um, the final one, I think. Uh, so that's that's like my normal my normal day job, and then um, I teach, uh, teach a couple like biz dev classes. Um, I do a mentorship. Um, what else? And then I, yeah, and then I just do this podcast once a week. Talk to, talk to my favorite artists and my friends. And dude, you're making me blush. <laughs> <laughs> well, me okay. and you, we've we've known each other for quite a few years, but and I've been a fan of your work for a long time. But this is like our first time, like actually sitting down and getting to talk, which is awesome. I'm excited to like learn more about you. And um, we got to work together a little bit, like here and there. Um, yeah, yeah. But a while ago. Yeah. Other than that, we've just been been friends, and like you share a lot of cool ideas and and things that help me to become a better artist. So, yeah, I appreciate you for that. Oh, you know you. <laughs> but like, man, you know what I was telling a friend? I was telling a friend the other day about how we were going to talk. And um, I realized how early you were in, like how before I guess I even got any better. You were in really early, like you were in in like 2018 or 19 or something like that. And I remember just being like, whoa, Zach Retz. I'm like, holy shit. Like, this guy likes my work. Like, that's crazy. And then over the years, it just, you know, as it, as more people start to like it, I was like, oh, I guess I am okay. I guess I'm, I'm like decent at art. But um, you were a big surprise. I was like, holy cow. That's pretty crazy. 
but we've been man art has changed so much since then i find digital painting has even changed so much since then like i remember starting well when did you start um i got my first like animation job 2014 on scooby-doo that was like my my first big job yeah that's a sick debut dude yeah Scooby -Doo. that's so dope <laughs> my yeah. first job was aic it was uh for a game or a film called arctic thunder justice squad i think the same time like 2014 and it was a uh it was a film, a full-length feature film about these foxes. It, I, I forget, I forget the even thing was even about, but it was a program that I got. It was kind of like a internship that I got out of college. I studied digital animation at Centennial College, and ever since then, yeah, I've been working. But obviously, off and on, off and on, off and on. But it's 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 crazy how saturated it's gotten in probably from like 2017 to 2000 and now right yeah saturated in terms of lots of artists lots of artists there's so many there's yeah. so many different kinds and there's so many different genres now and there's so many sub genres and and it's you can see it emerging and evolving and growing in all these different directions and it's it's crazy because there used to be only like 50 guys like 50 Instagram social media guys. Yeah. We're like, okay, there's Zach. There's Zadig. I remember listening to the podcast and someone bringing up Zadig. There was Catbib. There was like Hook, like 00000K. Um, and Theo Prince, obviously, and all these other guys. But now, like the floodgates are open. And it's just hundreds and hundreds of concept artists, hundreds of artists in general, like, making such interesting nuanced work like um you brought up a great question when i was reading the questions and you were talking about how do you come up with these funky compositions or something and i was like <laughs> i was like i was like wow like i never thought my compositions were interesting like what i always noticed about everyone else is that their compositions are interesting like you guys always come up with so many different variations of how a single subject matter could be done. And it's so fascinating. I don't know, do you feel like that's the same kind of thing? Um, I don't like, like my, my compositions come from, like, I try to look at everything except for what's being made in America right now, or like in our industry, <laughs> because <laughs> Uh, you know, you see the same compositions over and over again. And if I'm an artist, you hire me for like my vision, hopefully something I can bring new to the project. So I'll look at like anime, manga, uh, graphic novels, comics, um, you know, just anything else that would inspire like a cool composition. Um yeah, I guess that's that's how I go go about it. And when I when I see your stuff, it feels so um there's like um you like I, I look at it, I'm like, oh, you don't you don't give a shit. You just go for it. You like have <laughs> a you have an idea and you just go for it. And sometimes I'm like, man, I need to be more bold. Like you're not scared of just just doing something crazy and like if it works it works if not who cares um, yeah it doesn't matter you know it doesn't um the painting like doesn't bite you back it's also digital it's also you know if the vision calls for it like doesn't doesn't matter like there's no rules in digital painting it's the reason why i chose digital painting um is because there are no rules. You know, with oil and watercolor, there's a lot of commitment. Like you mess up the, you know, you gotta do a lot in the drawing stages. But with digital, like you can be so crazy. You can throw mat in, you can throw 3D code in, you can throw in all these different things. And you're basically throwing shit on the wall until you figure something out. And then you can ha have multiple files open and do different things within them. 
But being crazy took a long time. Like I remember being stiff and I remember painting compositions that were static and like really uninteresting and boring. And then as time progressed, I was able to let go. I think around 2019, 2020, I really let go. Um, but it's interesting. The I found that I actually started to let go the the less I looked at concept art. Mm. Like the more I looked at digital painting and, and digital art, the more in, confined I was. But the more that I watched films or, or lived life or or experienced presence, then I was able to get away from the traditional ways of making art and the judgments of it. And then somehow I tapped into something there. I think maybe it was having all of the fundamental knowledge previously and then stacking that on top with also trying to improve constantly and not, I could never make the last piece as bad as the next one. Like it always has to, I always feel like I have to make something better than the last or else it like really hurts. Um, so maybe that has something to do with it. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know. You know, I think those, like I never actually felt they were that crazy. You know what I mean? Like they, they, they always felt, uh, they felt good, but they never felt, they felt contemporary, but they never felt like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I look at our, so yeah, sorry, go ahead. Like when I look at a Rangia painting or I look at like a, like, like a Mullins or I look at like a, like an East Asia painting or, or, or like an Andre Cernov. I'm like, holy cow. I'm like, these guys really know how to read. Like Andre Cernov's stuff for Jacinta. I was like, oh my Lord almighty. They're so wild and free. And they're all, you, they look like they're all done on one layer and round brush only. And his fundamentals have become in, uh, second nature. And now he can just be free, which is kind of like where I'm feeling now, like all the fundamentals of whatever value, color, structure, lighting, that's all in, in tuned, like ingrained into my body. And now I can just paint whatever and not have to worry about those things. But I feel like those guys are so crazy good. And I'm just like always trying to play catch up. But man, it's nuts. That's a good point you made about like the fundamentals, having them become like second nature. So then you're not like um, so like rigid or stiff and you have to like, um, you don't always have to do a two value sketch or three value sketch first. You can just, you know, mess with your process, like throw some, throw some textures in and build something out of the textures or take different images, collage them together. Um, yep. You can just be free with it and like make something out of it. Yes, it's important. I find like, I don't really have a process. Like this is the problem why it's really hard to cut, make gum roads because it's, I don't know what I'm doing. Like I really don't. <laughs> I really, like I really, I, all I have is, um, so I am making, I actually am making a gum road. I'm finally finishing it and it should be out. I think this week. And it's about vision. Like one thing I do know about making something is that the idea and the vision is the most important part before any fundamental aspect of making a piece of art or anything, making a film, making a design, whatever it is, and being honest with your vision and telling the truth and it usually starts with a picture and you work from there. And from the picture, you establish it in writing. So you're gonna write down what you see in your head, almost like sketching with words. You're gonna just write down nonsense. You're gonna just put anything you can down. And then from that, you have a narrative. And now that you have a narrative, you can build a world out of it. So whether you wanna do a story or whether you wanna build a world to make a video game with, you have some things laid out that are true to you. And then it's also true to the audience. That kind of nuance by following your vision in that particular sequence will let you um, create something that not only will you be happy with, but something I think people will be happy with. 
And once you kind of establish that, the fundamentals are more then become tools to execute these ideas. So you don't really, you know, you, obviously the better those tools are, the better the idea comes out, but you only really need to be an okay draftsman to really like execute these ideas. Like it's all about nailing the writing, to be honest. Like most of my paintings, I write down like maybe six or seven pages of good information on, you know, the colors of the walls, what the world is like, what time it is in, what the people are like, uh, what the architectural status of the establishments are, what the, um, the layout is, what the sky feels like, what the sounds are. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's everything. It's everything. A vision has like, it attacks you from so many different angles and it's about like pinpointing it. And writing is just the best way to start it. But then when it gets to the painting phase, that's, that's the trouble I'm having is I can, I can get it down in the painting, but explaining how I do it is just, it's just such a hard thing to do. Hmm. That's, I'm wondering if you struggle with that, but. That's something I, I learned from you is um like just writing a paragraph like when you're when you're doing a painting just write it out describe like put like write it like a script or something and describe everything about it so then um i don't know that's that's helped me because a lot of times when i'm painting um i'm thinking like oh it's got to be the most beautiful painting ever uh, and i'm worried about like the the, this like color temperature like the this kind of lighting or like the perspective or anatomy or whatever but it's um you know if you can if you can um create a narrative and um transport the viewer into this world um like let them let them see the world through your eyes that's yes. that's more important because there's always yeah. going to be someone who can like render or paint better than you or something, but only, only you can have that like unique way of seeing the world. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. The, the level of nuance you get from your own brain is so much grander than, than being good at the fundamentals. Like, it, it, but it does help at the same time. It's a yin and a yang. Like they, they will elevate each other. But um, how many painters or artists do we know who aren't that fundamentally sound but paint amazing things? Their ideas are so inherently, unbelievably interesting. Even though their drawing isn't technically there, it's just interesting to look at. Like if you look at a, a atelier art, Sometimes you're like, man, this is beautifully drawn and the draftsmanship is wonderful and they, their hatching is perfect and it looks amazing, but it's so dead. It's like, it it just feels like this static, over-rendered person and it feels dated. And it makes you think like, is the vision the fundamentals? No. The vision is the, the idea that you had in your mind. The fundamentals are the catalyst. They're the things that execute this idea at the at the level that you need it to be but i think they serve each other's purpose as well like having a vision is sometimes informed better when your fundamentals are strong you know being able to see that scumble in your mind or being able to see it anatomically correct or maybe your vision emphasizes form so you know it's a give and a take but yeah. it's interesting yeah, you definitely need both because if you don't have like really strong fundamentals and you haven't gone out and studied from life and put in the years of work to get there, you'll never be able to tell a story and get someone to like latch on because you just can't you can't translate it into a 2D uh onto a 2D plane. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that is true. It's true. But it's it's Maybe because I'm speaking from a place of where I already have it already locked in. I already understand how all of it works. So the visions are strong for me in that way. And, and I'm speaking from a place of ignorance. But it's but the past couple of years, I'd say the past three years, I've really not tried to get away from the fundamentals, but focus on other aspects of what makes something beautiful. 
like um i really enjoyed enjoyed sound the ideas of sound design and how music and sound can influence a decision in making a painting or a drawing or a piece of art or imagery or move and movement it, those are the two parallels i guess that's a, also another reason why i got into film but it, something about sound and it's like language that translates so well to art and painting because it may be because it follows the same rules um especially in its treatment of contrast which is another thing that i've been studying a lot recently is the idea of contrast and its parallels and how you can create a painting or a drawing or a piece of music or a piece of art at a certain level like let's say um I'll give you an example. Like, let's say you create a story about a guy who goes to an office job, a really boring office job. And he goes there every day, nine to five. And he goes and he types on his computer. Now I'm establishing contrast, you know, by saying he goes to this boring job and the walls are all square and the computer is square and the table is square. And, you know, his car is square. And, um, you know, he reaches into his desk and he opens it up and there's a ball, right? I've just established contrast. Now, I've established a relationship between two different ideas and created a juxtaposition. So that's been very interesting. And using sound design to apply that to visual art has allowed me to open up a lot of doors. And it's also going to be part of the the uh, the gumroad that I'm going to be included in is how you can use sequence and imagery and sound to form your vision and build it in a way that is even more nuanced or more intense or less intense and 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 using that in conjunction with rhythm it's really interesting like the more you kind of indulge yourself in the in the outer aspects of drawing and painting but still maintaining art you get so informed on your own fundamental decisions on what you do in your craft it's, it's pretty crazy like it's infinite it just keeps going but it's yeah. so much fun i can't i can't see myself doing anything else it's awesome yeah it's interesting alexander was um from the previous podcast we we're talking about a similar thing with sound and he he creates these little soundtracks that go along with the short films he does and or sometimes he'll just paint he'll do a painting and then he'll make a soundtrack for it or work vice versa um, yeah so that's that's really cool do you um like when you're doing a painting um do you pick out like a playlist or certain songs that you'll listen to that that like go along with your painting to like get you in the mood yeah yeah i uh by the way, I absolutely love dude, his his paintings on Dead City are so fun. By the way, like have you seen his Dead City series? It's so good. It's so good. It's so good. It reminds me of some some um '90s film, early 2000s filmography by um I'm forgetting his name, Bad Lieutenant, and all those movies, and 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 some Christopher Walken movies. I don't, but um. Yeah, I'll listen to specific tracks. I love listening to what is suiting the vision. Um, usually if it's like a, an atmospheric painting, which they kind of all are, it, it I'll listen to a lot more shoegaze or atmospheric music, or I'll or I'll go through a playlist or I'll I'll maybe use ChatGPT to help me find a specific song genre and dig into that. And then I'll go back to Spotify and go back and forward and kind of work it out. Um, but, but um, yeah, 1000%. What I like to do sometimes is I'll watch a film clip, like uh, watch a David Lynch clip, or I'll watch a clip from something completely unrelated, like um, just some video of a guy doing an urban X exploration in a, in a, place and i'll turn the sound off and then i'll play a song of my of the vision that i find interesting and i'll i'll sync it up and i'll just watch it and and kind of get the brain flowing and then i'll stop them both and then i'll start painting and uh 
that's a process that's been a lot of fun. Or sometimes I'll grab, like I like to record videos a lot. I'll record videos of different things and synchronize them and edit them all together and try to find rhythm or something familiar in all of them. And then I'll, I'll um, resolve something that way. And then I can move forward and with my vision, but it's interesting. Like I, I, it's different every time I try to make it different every time, but, but um, you know, sometimes we fall into the patterns of how we always make art. Yeah. It gets tough, but... Yeah. I mean, it's good to, you know, if you, if you do find a pattern to kind of, you know, stick with that for a little bit, play it through. And then once you feel like you've kind of explored that, then you force yourself out of your comfort zone. You, um, you try and you fail you fail and you, you grow and you discover something new. Um, this kind of goes along with music. I do something kind of similar, but a little bit different. Like I love when I'm working on a piece, um, going on YouTube and finding like, um, you know, a documentary about like the, the time period or like this, this kind of location, um, or like a tourist who's like walking through a specific area. Um, so you can hear you, it's more of a, a full experience. Like if I can't go to the place, then, um, I can watch a GoPro foot footage of uh, a tourist, like walking through a, a busy market in India and I get like all the sounds and you see like the smoke and like the craziness. Um, it helps you to like get into that mindset and have um you know better better research on the area i guess one thousand percent one thousand percent but sometimes it can inform you on something different have you ever tried putting on a video of that and then turning the sound off and then putting on a video of something completely quiet like um you know like a field in korea like a like a, a field in south korea and you just hear the grasshoppers and that going even though it's completely illogical both of them don't fit it's interesting how you could feel something from that and that's kind of the juxtaposition i'm talking about you do something so uh unorthodox you spin kind of ideas on its head and then you experience them and then you take it and you put it in your toolbox and then that's how you can make really interesting nuanced stuff that hasn't been made before. I find that's a lot of fun. And you do that with everything. Like um, you can do it with anything. Like you can, um, you know, with a digital painting, you know, painting it traditionally first, importing it digitally, doing something like that, and then turning it into a clay model. Like, like uh, when I'll give you an example. Like when I was 18 or 19, I used to love, going to art shows and get, I mean, I still do, but, um, I used to hang out. I used to like not go to class and skip college, like literally skip class to go to my friends at OCAD university. This is in Toronto. And, uh, they studied fine art there. And, uh, I was studying animation at the time. And, um, I would go to all their shows and be so interested at the process and how different it was. Like they would make these unorthodox decisions and one of my friends, Mikey, made this head out of crayon, a head bust of his own head out of red crayon. And I was like, that's very interesting. And then he took the head and rubbed it against ampersand panel or ampersand panel or canvas or something like that, rubbed the head vertically across. And, um, and I was like, what the fuck are you doing? And then he's like, well, the class that I'm in asked me to make a self-portrait. This head's bust is for my sculpting class. And this is going to be my self-portrait. And I'm going to present the two and have a thesis about it. Dude, I was like, my head was, I, my head was spinning. Like, I, you know, when you get those hats, like, doo -doo -doo -doo. Yeah. I was like, that's, cr that is crazy. And ever since then, I thought about that. I'm like, it's not about the piece itself sometimes. It's the process to get to the piece that can make that final piece really interesting. And that's something I'll never forget. And a few other things like that. 
it was so fascinating. And I, and I couldn't believe that he took this beautiful sculpture. And I was like, you're ruining it. Like it was so well done. And he just, it, and the face was flat at the end. And uh, <laughs> wow. And ever since then, I, 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 I had been trying to mimic things like that for the sake of making great art. And because it's also about how you feel, right? Like it's another reason why I tell my friends as a joke, like I'm semi-retired. Like I don't work in concept really anymore. Like I don't, I don't, unless it's for the, an amazing project, like I don't really want to work for anybody. Um, it's either I art director direct at this point. And um, it's because the process itself is what gives me life. And sometimes concept art can be very demanding in this linear way. And I didn't choose art for that. I don't think most of us chose art um, to, to become the corporate, I guess, response, like, like something about making artwork in that particular way that I used to make it felt so corporate and felt so uh, hands on keyboard. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, uh, Og in the machine, Og in the machine. Like there was no difference between doing that and being a busser and, or being a bar back. I was like, yes, I'm still painting and I'm, I'm making these cool ideas, but every time I would present them in this way, they would say, okay, tone it down. Let's make it more like, let's make it more like, um, uh, this or that and the other of other painters and artists. And I'm like, well, I don't want to do that. Like, I want to, like, I'll do it, but I'm not happy about it. And it's, then I'm like, well, why did I choose this job? If, because it's so hard to even escape regular corporate. Sorry, you're like zooming in like a thick thing. <laughs> as soon as I get dramatic. Dude, I've been trying to fix my, uh, this <laughs> stupid, I bought this like really fancy, uh, like the new Apple monitor. And it's like, I don't want the camera to follow me around. How do I turn it off? <laughs> oh my God, dude, I'm dying. <laughs> but like, you I'm expecting and it's like, it's like, <laughs> People have been sending me like tutorials and everything, but like it's, it's like I cannot, I cannot find it. I do not see the button to turn it off. Um, whatever, we'll keep trying, dude. Yeah, but that's just you know, maybe it's an early age crisis thing. Like I, I know it's most of your podcasts really get into uh, the feelings, like get into uh, our like the 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 trials and tribulations of being an artist. So I'll 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 open up to. Yeah. like the i was having really bad existential dread like out of nowhere i would go to sleep like uh i'm 29 now i would go to sleep and all i could think about was the end like me nosferatu two hands you know in a in a in a bed and I'm like telling my grandkids like, you know, what they should do with their savings accounts. And then, you know, my, my kid, my kid themselves comes in and what do I do with my funeral and all these things? I couldn't stop. I couldn't, I couldn't get it out of my head. Um, I just did the, the feeling of the forever empty was, was so horrible. And then I thought about it and I was like, well, maybe it's something I'm doing right now. That's making me unhappy. That's causing me to, think in these regrettable forms. And then I thought about it for a couple of days and I was like, man, I, why am I doing, why am I not doing what I really want to do? And it's, you know, it, I was, I was working for unity and I was doing these, this artwork for this, for this game. I'm not sure if I could even say it, but I, but I was doing artwork for this game and it was a very great project, but wasn't my project and that's what really bummed me out and so once i started to take that kind of agency and and do these things um and start to direct and write and build scripts and build full featured finished products i was like man this this is what's right this is what i should be doing and then all those feelings went away all that existential dread was gone i'm so happy and in retrospect, now that I think about it, I was unhappy about listening to someone else's vision when I myself am a visionary. 
for making art as you are as any other concept artist like you're you you have these these visions that pop up in your mind when someone explains something to you that's so powerful so incredibly powerful that it's insane to me that we're limited to these roles where we just make these paintings that go to 3d artists that then go to the guys who render then anime and yes it goes down the pipe but it gets diluted and it gets caught up by producers and then it gets mixed up and then it's it's a whole different thing by the time it gets there and that's what hurts so much and that's what caused me to feel that dread of like my, this beautiful work that I'm making is getting tossed into the ether and nobody's going to appreciate it because it's, it's, it's become, di it's, it's fallen through so many filters and I had to, yeah. So I just completely changed my way. But anyways, that was the point I was, I was going on about was that um, agency on your own work brought me a lot more happiness than giving it away so that was the i don't know if you feel that at all or you're happy with working on the stuff that you're working on or if you ever want to move up to something or i think you did art direct actually i don't trip and so you've, you've had that experience yeah so. uh yeah i i relate to what you're saying um i think now i usually choose projects that really respect the artists and um usually it's going to be like a movie or, or a short film or something that um, it's not, it's like you mentioned, like going through the filters, it's like less, less of that. Um, so like something like spider verse um, a lot of times we, we paint a frame and they put our exact frame um, in the movie as like a, as like a card or something, or we do, a piece of concept art and when it gets passed on to the other departments the art directional is always like make it look exactly like this painting um so experiences like that are really cool and um the the short film that i did with weta um the war is over um that was a cool experience because everyone at weta they've been doing live action stuff their whole career and now they have a chance to work on the first like animated movie that they've that they've done and it's like a it's an interesting like painterly style so everyone on that movie was like really pumped and excited and like enthusiastic about making something so i'd like i'd send them my painting and they're like they're all like oh how can we like make the ground look like this and everything like i'd ne previous experiences were like when i'd send a painting um they would um they would be it they weren't excited they were more like like fighting me on it um and that yeah that 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 sucked so yeah the weta thing was um was really awesome i'm glad that that turned out really well um yeah, where where were we going with this? Um <laughs> you were going like listening to other people and not and creating agency for yourself. Like you that project that you and you guys even did you guys win an Oscar on that? Yeah, yeah. See what I'm saying, dude? See what I'm saying? They let us do it once, we win Oscars. They don't let us do it, they don't win nothing. No. It's just this is the business. And like, I don't know, man. It's you have to trust your artists the same way you have to trust a director of photography, the same way you have to trust a producer, the same way you have to trust anybody. And, and like, the, obviously your taste is going to be, and your, and, and the cohesion of the project is going to be um, fulfilling for that specific thing. Like it, it's, you know, have you ever been hired for a project that was so, um, sorry, my, my, uh, my laptop's going to die, um, has been so wrong. Like you get hired and you're like, and they're like, okay, this is what you got to do. We got these characters, this environment, this thing. Um, okay, go. And then you see the brief and you're like, dude, I'm completely wrong for this role. Why am I here? And they're like, no, no, no. You just got to do it in a different style. It's like, it's just never going to work. It's never going to work. 
For a project where they let you have your vision your way, it's the clearest path to success because you know exactly how to do it and how to make it. And you know what an audience likes and you you built your whole career around not only satisfying your taste and your needs and your love and your ideas and what you believe art makes great, but now you're like, okay, what does an audience love at the same time? Because you also love when people like your work. So it's it goes hand in hand. It's like helping others and it's it's this whole thing. So for them to trust you, is is it's it's bound to be successful but when people go like no 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 it has to be like this already successful product um you have to do it this that and the other especially when it's a producer or it's a or it's or it's like an art manager if you've ever run into one of those you're like who has who literally their last job was like being a dj or something i don't know where they come from half of them i don't know where the fuck I, I don't know what planet they're on when they make it here but they come into these jobs and then they tell you to do all these things. And then their critique is like, oh, it needs more green, needs more yellow or whatever it is. And you're like, dude, you have no idea what you're talking about. You have no idea what the end product is going to be. You have no vision of this entire thing. You're just riding this bus into the ground and you're just doing your nine to five. Drives me nuts. Drives me at, it drives me crazy. And, uh, yeah, and it always shows in the end product. Like how many how many games and how many films do we know where they go through that similar pipeline and these games never make it. They they die off a month in or these films just just roll over the hill. Nobody sees them straight to whatever it is, not even Amazon. They go straight to straight to Tubi or whatever it is and and nobody gets to see them. It it drives me up the wall. It's but it all boils down to trust, I think. Trusting your artists. It's, it's crazy, but whatever. Yeah. When you're hired on a project and you feel respected as an artist, um, that's that's one of the greatest things because then you can you like have the freedom to be yourself and explore. And um yeah, and like you said, when when they're trying to like force you into like something else it's like just hire someone else like hire someone else who already does that It'll make everyone's live lives easier dude smh smh every time i see stuff happen like that i shake my head i say you know what cut the malarkey they need to cut the malarkey it's just but i think it's an origin of also maybe people who are talent recruiters I feel like talent recruiters are a special kind of evil. They, uh, you know, it's not their fault, I guess, but it's also like they make a lot of the big decisions sometimes. Like they pass up or whatever it is, or they 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 have the eyes and the ears on what's out there. Whew, sometimes it's crazy. But, but anyways, um, a question I really wanted to ask you is um, you go to the gym a lot. Um, I go to the gym a lot, you, as you can tell. Um, what have you found that to be a huge impact on your work and as your motivation to make art every day? Yeah, uh, definitely. Because uh, it's mostly for my like mental well being. Um, like all day, uh, I'm I'm sitting at my desk. I'm working. I'm you know very sedentary, uh, and then um, all day I'm kind of looking forward. I have it in the back of my mind. It's like, all right, what workout am I gonna do? I'm like pumping myself up. I'm like, all right, I got my playlist ready. Uh, my headphones are charged, and I'm just looking forward to that all day. And then I go to the gym. And I just listen to my death metal and just destroy myself at the gym uh, do you drive to the gym um currently i do um that's a that's the best man when you're yeah. driving to the gym and you're hyping yourself i'll be like i'm gonna absolutely crush it today oh my god dude so much fun <laughs> so yeah i don't know what it is it's like you know you do something you're like all like creative and it's taking a lot of like mental power like all day like 
doing art and then you go to the gym and you just do something totally different. You're just like, all I have to do is focus on this muscle and moving the weight from here to here. And you just focus on that. I think it's like a good reset for me. Um, and it makes me feel good about myself. Um, I'm not like just sitting at my desk getting fat or something. It's like, um, I'm, I'm staying in shape. I'm, uh, looking better. Um, you see like little improvements over time. So mentally it's, it's huge. I'm, oh, yeah. I'm going to do it for the rest of my life. So. Yeah. It's really hard to go back once you get really into it. Like I found if I take longer than three days off, Oh dude, dude, I'm like fighting demons. I'm fighting. Yeah. Mental. But it's like, I never used to be like that until I started working out a lot. Like I do a lot of, uh, jujitsu, like nogi jujitsu. Oh, cool. Uh, I train a, quite a bit. Um, I know for a fact some of the guys at the gym are probably listening, but but uh they love they love this stuff. But but um uh the fortitude that it developed to get up in the morning and do things that I don't want to do. Like I don't want to take my car to the mechanic. I don't wanna I don't wanna get up at eight. I wanna, you know or taking an ice bath or doing this or whatever it is. Like, I don't want to do any of that. I want to, you know, eat life cereal and I want to, you know, sit on the couch and watch a movies all day. Like, but be, that habit has built such a strong reinforcement to s looking forward to making harder decisions, almost like embracing the, it sounds so corny. It sounds so David Goggins. It, I'm not even the big, I'm not a, even a big David Goggins guy. But just embracing the grind is so much, is so lovely once you find it in something that's almost kind of easier. Like I found working out to be way easier than sitting down and painting. Like going to the gym and, and doing any exercise, like pull-ups, sit-ups, push-ups, like all that stuff is way easier than sitting down and trying to write or conceptually come up with something. But once you can get that block into your life, it opens the gates to do those things that are just slightly harder. Yeah, that's that's the key. Doing something that's super difficult that no one wants to do. But if you can just you can just do it, then it yeah. changes your mindset for the rest of rest of your day. You're like, I, I went to the gym, I did my full workout, I got sweaty, I'm sore, I can hardly move but I accomplished something really hard that most of most of humans are not go going to do. Um, and then, you know, the rest <laughs> of your day, it's like, Oh, all I have to do is like do these paintings and, you know, it's like, you can do it. 1000% paintings become so easy once you get Jack, bro. Yeah. Once, super Jack. But like, but you're specifically, you, you're really jacked. I'm like semi jacked. I'm like, a hundred i'm like one what am i like 170 right now you're probably like 185 i would guess like 190 wow i'm 185 good guess i could see it like especially like, ah, <laughs> ah dude <laughs> sometimes i get amped man yeah. like but um uh, you know what the same thing starts to happen with painting you get a good idea in your head or a good vision sometimes i'll be walking down the street and I'll just, like, I, I don't know what will come over me. Like, I'll see a tree a certain way, or, you know, you see the, the concrete a certain way, or you see a, somebody a certain way, and this whole world kind of floods into you. I don't know if you've had that experience. You've, you've definitely had that experience, like, especially if you have a week of painting, where you just, you've done nothing but art, and you go outside, and everything looks like a painting. You know, you look like, a, you look at a tree, and it looks like, it looks like a painting, like, especially when you look at leaves, you can see the cool and the warm and it's like, it's so awesome. And then you go and see a person and you and imagine this whole character about them and their whole life and this whole idea. It's the same thing if you watch too many movies, like I went through a period of watching like a lot of 70s films hmm. and uh, like John Cassavetti, like, um, um, you know, uh, Alan Palukia, like all, all these really great like gritty 70s movies and uh 
I started to walk around outside and all I could imagine are like, you know, newspaper blowing across the street and like, uh, like the classic, like a 1970s, like a uh, midnight cowboy thing going on. It's interesting. Like, I guess that's how influence works. Like the more things you consume that are tasteful or I guess essential or, or artistic, it influences your present moment and how you see reality in that spectrum. And to be able to control that. So like if you spend a week watching, you know, let's say um, noirs, right? Um, you'll go outside and you can see how you could reimagine the world as a noir in, in, in a, such a vivid way, in such a clear, vivid way that is so fascinating to me. Like it's this, it's the thing we talked about earlier, like listening to sound. Like I wonder if you just listen to one genre of music, does that affect your entire influence on how you view people and ideas and 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 uh, story and and contrast and all these things? Like this, it's so fascinating. Yeah, I think when um, yeah, definitely, I spent like like how I learned to paint was basically just like copying master paintings. So yeah, I definitely, I saw the switch. Like I would just go outside and I would see everything as a, like a master painting. Be like, Oh, this warm <laughs> and cool temperature, uh, the, the value grouping, the, <laughs> the limited palette. How could I do this as a limited palette? And then you just, you turn into like a weird, like art nerd, but and you tell somebody about it and you sound like a crazy person yeah oh look at this tree you're like yo do you not see the relationships between this tree and this bush right now and like the cool light hanging off of this tree looks so cool and your friend who doesn't do art would be like dude i think you need to go see somebody you're like <laughs> yeah <laughs> by the way we can take off the sunglasses if you want yeah it's start the sun's starting to go down <sighs> nice to see you pal yeah <laughs> um dude so you you're in toronto now right montreal montreal okay um oh yes yeah, so we're in same time zone um did you grow up there i grew up in scarborough ontario so i grew up uh in toronto on the east side so outside of toronto is scarborough and scarborough is almost I don't want to say it's like the Detroit, but like it's a very it's a poor neighborhood. Like I had a very um, lower class upbringing. Like I I was very I like to joke with my friends. Like I crawled out of the slimes to be where I am today, but um, it was it was pretty rough. But um, you know it was I wouldn't want to have it any other way. Like no other way. It was such a beautiful stewing pot of every different ethnicity and every different culture. And, you know, like I saw everything, like I saw every type of relationship. I saw every type of family. I saw every type of interaction, whether it was most heated and boiled and, and I saw people in gangs get into fights and all. And, and I've just seen, I've seen it all growing up in that neighborhood. And it's influenced my life and my body of work so much and it's gotten gentrified now, but growing up, it was really, really, it was crazy. Um, but my family lives there now. My father lives there. Um, my grandparents and my brother lives just outside of that in Oshawa. It's a little bit East Northeast. And, uh, he just had a baby and, you know, so I'm a, new uncle which is which is fantastic but we're uh we're twins so i have like a twin brother which is pretty crazy but That's wait awesome. are you a twin? you and tad aren't twins right no i'm five years older whoa big bro status dude yeah did you and guys ever get fights when your kids and just beat them up <laughs> no we never once fought because i think uh the age difference was enough where um like when I was like five years old, I had to take care of him as a baby. So I was always like taking care of my baby brother. Um, so I just never wanted to fight him. <laughs> but so you're normal, you were a normal person. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like it's more normal to like fight with your siblings more, but 
I don't know. Um, did you probably fought a little bit with your brother being like the same age? Dude, we fought so much over <laughs> nothing, over nothing. Like um, socks. Who wore my pants? These are my shoes. Dude, yo, bro. It was I, literally over absolutely nothing. But it's funny. We would get into these fights and then be best friends like five minutes later. Like it would be like this hour long screaming match like, ah, and all these fights. And then and then five minutes later, I would go into his room or he would come into the room and he'd be like, I'm sorry. Or we just act like nothing would happen or just like resolve it. But um, what I did appreciate about that is it taught me how to deal with conflict. Um, it taught me how to be in tune with my emotions. Getting it out early when I was young really taught me as I got older how to how to calm down, how to rationalize things, how to deal with a high heated situation, um, how to deal with immaturity, how to deal with my own immaturities. Um, but it, it was it was interesting. He were so alike, but so different at the same time. Like he, the same obsession I have with art, he has the exact same obsession with cars. Like he knows everything there is to know about cars, every intricate part. Even growing up, when we would we would we would just be like sitting in a room and we would hear a car outside, and we used to play this game where I'd be like, "Okay, guess what car it is." Like I'd look outside, I'd hear the car, and I'd be like, "Guess what car it is?" He literally could sit there and be like, uh, "You know, uh, two thousand eight uh, Volkswagen Jetta City." right off the top of right off the dome i couldn't i couldn't believe that he could do that he had such an affinity with hearing and sound and music even though he doesn't know how to play any instruments but he's so good with um rhythm and and these things i learned so much about that but uh we have the same sense of humor the same kind of personality ish but when we would fight, we would really like go at each other's throats. But it was interesting how we were still best friends at the end of the day. Like it's, it's very, twins, I guess, are kind of maybe unique that way. But. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and um, what what kind of career does he do now? He works at Volkswagen as a consultant, like a sales oh. consultant. Salesman. Oh. Salesman at Volkswagen. Um, do you guys look similar? No, we look a little bit different. I look very Italian. Like, uh, I don't know if you can tell, I am Italian. But he is also Italian, but he looks more like my mom. So he looks very, like, um, Caucasian, like, white, white. Like, he looks more like you, actually. Ah. Actually, he looks just like you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he... He's such a character. I don't know. I love him to death. And I love the new niece that we have. And she's so fantastic. She's so cute and like compact and mm -hmm. so weird, yo. Like it was my first time being at a hospital and seeing a baby be born. And really, it was so nuts. Like I've never been at like a childbirthing hospital. Like I've never seen childbirth before. So witnessing that, I was in like so much shock. Like I remember hugging my brother. Cry I remember crying. A whole family was crying. She was crying. Um, and this baby just looking at all of us like we're crazy people crying around her. And then I remember leaving, going to a dinner that night and not even being able to think with my own head. Like all I could do was... Uh, think about the baby and protecting this baby and being there. And that was it. And then other than that, I was, I was almost thinking in front of my eyes. Like I, I couldn't, I couldn't see images in my head or be myself. All I could do was be present and see what's in front of me and almost respond to things in that moment. And then with the times that I did get to have moments where I could think, it was just baby, pure baby, and nothing else. I've never felt anything like that in my life, and it took two, two or three whole days 
for me to like calm down or like get it out of me. Absolutely nuts. But um, it's crazy, yo. That is crazy. You have to change your uh, your Instagram to Uncle PNG. <laughs> Uncle Dad PNG. Yeah. I tried. I tried. I couldn't find it. <laughs> uh. I'm try. I used to try to get all. I have Papa. I have Mama, and now I want like Uncle. I tried Grandpapa, but I couldn't. I couldn't. Couldn't find it. That'd be fun for, for film, but it looks like it's probably already taken. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and it's just you and your brother. No other siblings. Just me and my brother. Yeah. Just me and my twin. Cool. I have a couple half sisters, but they're on my mom's side from like a previous marriage. But I don't really uh talk with them. So I kind of like if someone asks me, I go like, oh no. Just just me and the bro. But yeah. it's crazy. I met them once and they look one of them looks just like my brother. It's it's like a, my brother with a wig. And I was like, I gotta go. I was literally like, yo, I gotta go. <laughs> I, I literally, I don't have time for any of this. <laughs> I was like, it was nice meeting you. Uh, a wonderful, good luck on your things. Like, uh, and uh, goodbye. Oh, crazy. I was with my girlfriend at the time and we saw her, we saw her and we were like, holy shit. <laughs> Sometimes I get the shivers just thinking about it. <laughs> that is weird. <clears throat> you know, Some people say it weirds them out with, if they'd known me for a while and then they meet my brother because we have like the same like mannerisms and our personality is so similar um it's just he's like a little bit shorter and he's got like long curly hair so, <laughs> other than that we're pretty much the same i think i follow him too in his paint he's a great painter too you guys are both so good and he he looks it looks like someone took your face and like cut it out like this and just whoosh, put it on another guy <laughs> it, just, it looks so funny but that's just really that's just like siblings in general like they all look the same like but to uh, wow yeah do you find you have a big difference between people who are only children and and people who are with siblings when it comes to their relationships with art have you ever noticed that difference at all Hmm. I think um, only children or sometimes the youngest child. I've I've noticed from like teaching and, you know, being at some studios uh, where I'm working with people that sometimes they or a lot of times they are. um a little bit more um they they have different priorities in life um their priorities are more on like having like a nice balanced life or kind of taking life a bit more chill um whereas oldest siblings or um um yeah i think oldest siblings you have there, there's a bit more like pressure to um because you've kind of had like a lot of responsibility your whole life so there's you feel like a, a bit more pressure to like um you know oh i need to i need to work really hard i need to like set set myself up for the future i need to like take care of take care of the people around me um stuff like that i think you're just kind of like used to that your whole life um at least that's how i am um yeah, and like only only children, like you have both of your parents' attention all the time. And sometimes you can get I'm trying to like choose my words wisely, you know. Your children like, listen. Cause yeah. Um <laughs> yeah. and it doesn't go for everyone, but some sometimes you're um, you know, you're used to um you know that you have like a support system around you a lot um so sometimes there's not like as much pressure and urgency like put on you um which i'm i'm a bit jealous of i wish i had like a little bit more of that where i could like kind of 
calm down a little bit and just like relax and enjoy. Um, but it's, yeah, it's just not, it's not in me. And it's something that I'm, I'm working at. I'm trying to get better with. Mm. How do you, how, how do you feel? Do you feel, cause like, it's interesting when in the beginning you were talking about, you're going to be very choosy on the jobs you pick and, um, you're going to, um, you're only going to work on stuff that, uh, that like satisfies you like artistically and, and where you can grow. Um, it, there's that balance, but also you have to make money too. Right. So how are you dealing with that and balancing that? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, Mr. Rats, money. <laughs> Um, do you mind? Do you mind if I explain that in a minute? I just got to go to the washroom, but also got to get my charger for my yeah. Thing. Would you we can uh, we'll pause. Okay, I'll be two minutes or not even like a minute. Cool, I'll pause. Cool, we're back. All right, Mister Ritz, Mister Ritz crackers. So, um, money. Great question. The the goal with getting into filmmaking was it. Um, it wasn't really a blind choice. It was more of um, an opportunity to make not only better money, but I think to start in an opportunity where I can grow actually a lot more. I found with the directing that um, I love writing scripts. I love doing storyboards. I love the process of producing. I love the... Um, the entire thing, like I love the overseeing, I love the control, I love the the vision part of it. And so the goal was to, the goal is to make short films, submit them to festivals, get grants to make future short films, and then use that grant money to make bigger films, then write full length future scripts and get budgets for that. And so it's all about pitches. And so I, 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 um, I've made a lot of connections with some people in the film industry that can, that are helping me kind of work through it all and build it up. And I don't know when, you know, when you just believe, like you just, you just, you just know it's going to happen and you know, it's going to work and you just, all you got to do is work hard and it'll get there. So I never, I never thought about money. That's, that's actually like, like, that's the one thing I've never thought about in my life. Like, hmm. it's, prob it's not necessarily a, a problem. I think it might be a problem to some people, but um, it's the one thing that I never considered. <laughs> I never, <laughs> you, brought, you brought up a great point, Mr. <laughs> But so I never, do you did you get uh, some funding for this current one or have you like taken your savings and funding it yourself so i've i've taken i've taken my savings and i've i've um funded it myself for this first one the second one is going to be grant funded and um i just know i just know that the films that i make because of how much I love film and and if I love it as much as painting, which I do, if not sometimes even more, um, that it will do well, especially in this category, especially in the beginnings and especially in the indie stages. It just has to. Um, I, I, I don't know, you know when you just know, it's like you just, you know the idea is good you know, the boards are going out right. You know how to move people around. You know how to direct them. You know, it just, it, everything feels so intuitive. Like when I had people on set and when I was working on the first set and when I was talking to the actors and theatrical movement and masking and all these things and blockings and it's just, it's, it's, it just felt so natural and it felt so right. And I know it's such a valuable thing to be like, it, it, I don't think most people realize like, concept artists especially good ones are can make amazing filmmakers not saying that they all are but 
the inherent skills that you are given as a concept artist is uh, is a filmmaker on steroids. Like you are, you have not only every understanding of the fundamentals when it comes to each shot and composing them. Not only can you do that from your head, but now you have people actually standing there with you. You you understand the costume design. You under you can, well you can't understand costume design. You can understand blocking in theater movement script writing. Believe it or not, good screenwriting goes so well with concept art. The 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 there's such a complementary skill set. Like I when I started writing screenplays, like I couldn't believe how much fun it not only fun it was, but how easy it was. And the game you can kind of play with painting, you can do it the same way in screenwriting. You can, you know, treat every scene like a painting in this way. Like you can have the description of a scene be so low contrast and, or, or say, let's say like a high key where, you know, everything's elevated and then immediately fall off and treat the rest of the film as a low key and do stuff like that. Or, you know, um, I don't know. It's, it's kind of hard to articulate in this moment, but it's like uh, your color scripting, but it's like in real life. Yeah. So. You're, you're, your color scripting in life it's it's um i can't explain it maybe maybe it's just a maybe it's just different for me but it feels so intuitive like every part of the every part of the the thing like i'll give you an example like i suck at math i suck at math i suck at science i suck at golf actually i'm okay at golf but like when it comes to painting drawing i can say that i'm okay i'm good i'm decent i'm good at it we, we can all say me, me and you you are good at it i'm good at it everyone who we're all in the echelons with are good at it so I, I i've seen the screen plays that i've been writing they are they just feel at that same quality so i just had to pursue it i'm like if, if you know i i've always wanted to make a film i've always wanted to see it come to fruition and if I let money kind of get in my way and I think about money too much, um, it's just going to muddy it up. Like I, I've already been in conversations about budgets and having budget meetings and like talking about what's possible, what's not, not possible and having workarounds. And it just, it just kills the process. It kills the flow. And it, it, I guess also coming from a place where I had no money for so long, that when money does come into your life, you kind of don't think about it. I don't know if you have a similar experience like that, but that's what it's like for me. That's interesting. Yeah, I think for me, it's a little different. Like I had no money forever. And then I started making some money. Um, and now I'm, I'm like scared to death. I'm like, I don't want to like go back to that that point where I have no money again. So I'm like extra cautious about everything. But I guess a good thing about coming from no money is that you're used to living um, like way below your means. Um, you don't you don't have to go out to eat every meal. Um, you don't need a super nice car. There's all there are all these things that you you you've never had. So um, like I I remember in L.A. I was art directing at like a major studio, like making a good salary and everything. And, um, I had no car. I rode my bike to work every day and people thought I was nuts. I was like, I don't, I don't need a car. I live close enough. Like everything's here. Like, what do I like? I may as well save the money. <laughs> but I think, do you think that experience trumps money? sometimes for some moments um what do you mean like okay let's say you have you have only five thousand dollars left and you have a chance to make a movie and you only have four thousand you know but it's an experience you've always wanted would you take it yeah experience i think does trump money because you can always you can always do something to make some more money um 
and especially now where I'm at in life, like if I, if I want to do something and I think that might be a cool experience, like I'm just going to do it. I'm not going to be like, oh, that might be like an expensive trip or something. It's like, it, it doesn't matter. That trip is going to be in my memory forever. It's going to influence me as a, a person, as an artist. Like, I'm just going to go do it. Like I can always make some more, yeah. more money or something. Okay. The, the, sorry, but the, um, that's true. That's 100% true. Like you, you'll make the money again. I think, especially if you are confident in your skills and you can get good at something like, like you, you could start a whole new skill tomorrow. And you will be as good as you are at the art that you're making in probably half the time. Hmm. You know what I mean? So, you know, so it's also like, why not? Like, if you know, if you know you can be successful, like I found concept art is one of the hardest skills you could possibly ever get. It's one of the hardest job markets you could possibly ever get into. Like, if not like the hardest, like, I mean, okay, obviously there's like being an astronaut or whatever it is, but like, but like concept art is, um, it's tough. It's insanely competitive. It's so cutthroat. It's so demanding and it's, and it's so saturated now and it's, you know, and, um, the fact that we made it this far, it can make art this great. And we, we reached these, like, like I never thought I'd get this good at concept art, so it's or whatever it is, a drawing or painting or whatever it is. I never thought I'd be this far. Like I didn't think the visions would take me there. So it made it gave me a huge confidence for how far I can get in film. And so it's another reason, right? But yeah. like I bet you when you started concept art for the first time, you kind of have an idea. You're like, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get good. Like I'm gonna get super good. But you don't you don't really see the end picture. You just know that you're, every time you finish a painting, you sit down and you're like, man, I'm sick. Have you ever had that feeling? Like, especially early, like when you're young, you go like, dude, I'm, you're like, I'm unstoppable. And then like the next day you look at it and you're like, God, what was I thinking? Like, I suck. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely a few points. There's like little milestones that you hit. I, I feel like um, it's like the first time I understood like value grouping. I was like on a high for like, I don't know, like a month. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, I cannot fail. I'm just so good. <laughs> and then when I, when I start to understand color tem temperature, I'm like, oh shit, that's why, that's why it feels so like juicy. Like, <laughs> dude when you figure out a new fundamental isn't it so sick yeah. like you feel on top of the world and you're like man i'm a god like especially when you figure out like i learned temperature i still don't use it correctly but i i don't know if you learned it from the same place theo prince used to have a a link on his website that had a uh i don't know if it's still there this was years ago but he has like an addition on his website that just that just covers temperature and it just talks about the the um, temperature and how it works and works with our eyes. And I remember studying it. I remember making a painting that day, and then doing it on some on like a sphere or something like that, like a like a pixel lock sphere, and going, "Whoa! I just discovered the secret to the universe. Like I am, I am gonna be the best." <laughs> Two weeks later, forgot the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> that's oh. awesome i learned it from um mark bogus um i don't know if you know him yes, yes. yeah he, like the landscape painter yeah like traditional like he does like big like oil paintings um yeah I, I remember signing up for his like um email newsletter that he sends out and he just like writes like a couple paragraphs and um yeah, one of those who's explaining color temperature and it just, um, I just understood it. I was like, oh, warm and cool. 
all right, I got it. And then you kind of expand from there and you're like, oh, is it, is it shifting a little bit more yellow, a little bit more red? Like you just train your eye to see those like subtle shifts. That was, that was huge. The shifting is what was crazy. I think I also learned it in, I had a digital painting class. This was 2015. I had a digital painting class with, this was at Centennial College. Marco Bucci was my teacher. And I think this was before Marco Bucci was Marco Bucci. So he was, he was a teacher at our college and uh, he was teaching us about temperature, but it, kind of went one year out the other like in college I was so bad I don't know what about school that was like so I didn't want to learn but um once I kind of got a figure of it and, and exactly like you mentioned when you see it on the hue scale and and you know how to shift it correctly I used to think like oh you just go to the ambient and then you kind of like work it from there but you actually, there's like a whole, you have to think of the local color and then you have to shift accordingly to the local color towards the cool. And there's like a whole thing to it, but it's, it's, it's super fascinating. I would, I would also recommend if you, if you like uh, want to take your temperature, but a little bit of a higher level, do you know what Munzo color theory is? No. So Munzo color theory is kind of what, I learned it from Scott Robertson and then Mullins talked about it a little bit. And then Devin Corwin wrote a book on it or wrote a, has a book on it. Munzo color theory. I would write, I would, this is, this is what will take your um, <laughs> little notepad. In the, yeah. So, so, <laughs> so how do you spell that? Um, so he, he, it's a small little booklet. It's like 20 pages, but there's, you'll see a bunch of graphs on it. And it's an incredible fundamental on knowing what the peak chroma is. So it's chroma, it's saturation levels, and then it's value. So depending on, like every hue has a peak chroma when it's applied to sunlight. And it, it has a peak chroma for its value range. Like I'll give you an example, like a, a highly saturated blue um, is darker than a highly saturated yellow, obviously, right? Like it's because of how much pigment is in that blue and, and due to its temperature, it's going to be way darker on the value scale than the yellow that is at its peak chroma, right? Mm -hmm. so what the key of Munzo color theory kind of teaches you is, okay, how can I maximize this color and get its brightest and get the peak chroma at the same time and matching that yellow at the same value. So on a graph, it'll show you how far the ranges go before it tilts over to the next value scale. And you'll, with that knowledge, you can be able to paint like cars or anything metallic and it'll be super accurate to, um, to how it is in life. And, and you can push it really, really far. Like you can get saturation levels that are like insane um and feel right and feel correct um but i mean if you're already practicing it enough and you understand temperature it might not be that important but um it's interesting like you'll you'll find something in there that will teach you something that is is very very um fresh like a fresh take yeah that's awesome yeah i'll definitely look into that i think um when i've taken classes that are too too much of like theory or like um too much of like graphs and like measuring things out uh then it becomes not fun for me um and i i think for me it's like i'd rather just you know kind of understand what happens like you, you like you mentioned a car like for me i think it's um, more exciting for me to go outside and just paint a bunch of cars in different lighting and kind of see what happens. And then mm -hmm. you train your mind to be like, okay, I know what happens to some of these darker colors when they get fully saturated and hit by sun. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I think I like to go a lot by just how it feels like, does it feel right? 
I think that might be the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. All black and white. I mean, I mean, Sargent didn't have Monzo color theory, so you know. Yeah, you're probably right. But if I can, I'll I'll look into it. If I can learn something, then that's gonna be awesome. Um, what? So after college, what did you do? Um, like, how did you get your first job? Um, I got my first job during college. Oh, I was nineteen, and I got it at at uh, AIC as an internship program. They offered it to me because they liked the concept art. I was literally in a digital animation class making concept art, and they're like, "You're in the wrong program," and so they found me an internship like outside of class to satisfy because they're like, "Yeah, we want you for this thing or whatever," and so I started there, and then I after college when I finished my internship. I I worked at this place called W Games at a mobile gaming casino place. And then uh I quit because it was so painful. Like it, the people I worked with were amazing though. They they were the most beautiful people I've ever worked with in my life. Um Wait, so, so you were doing like the like the screens and casinos, like those really like polished yeah, so like so what we were doing was uh, we were doing the world map. So it was called Neverland Casino. And we were building these world maps. And and this the goal of the game was like, you know, you could play in Toronto if you're in Toronto. So we'd go to your GPS and then we'd find like, and then you'd spin in the slots and you get the, you know, the CN Tower. And then you get like uh, all these landmarks. And, you know, I was in this meeting where they brought in these, these like data analysts who worked on slot machines in real life and they were showing them algorithms on how to get people like hooked on certain algorithms for winning and losing when you pull the slots. And that's when I had to quit. I was like, dude, I can't be part of that. Like that's like suicide fuel. Like, could you imagine like I came in every day, like on, on the, the, like on my tippy toes and like, Oh yeah. Like I'm going to paint some trees. I'm going to paint this. And then I walk into a, a meeting and it's just some guys talking about how they can't wait to get someone's grandma to buy like $5 worth of these coins so that they can, you know, keep playing these slots or they're waiting on the odds of a kid who's given their iPad to play this game and to accidentally buy a thousand dollars of whatever. Right. Uh, yeah. And I could not be a part of that. I was like, this is so insane. This is insane. And so I quit and I remember people giving me a lot of shit for it. Um, cause they're like, oh, it's, you know, it's a, co it's a job, it's a blah, blah, blah. But I'm like, I'm not doing it. And yeah. then, uh, I worked a lot of service. Like I, one of my favorite jobs actually, believe it or not, was working at bars. Like I loved working at bars. It was so much fun. I worked at bars forever. Like I worked at this place called the Gladstone hotel, um, as a bar back. And then I did a little bit of serving and it was unbelievable it was one of my favorite experiences ever such a great place in toronto such a wonderful experience made such great friends there and <clears throat> i did my best painting around that time too like the experiences of you know for some reason working an art job that i hate really depletes me like i come home and i don't want to do any i don't want to make any paintings or drawings for myself and i don't, don't learn anything and <clears throat> working at a bar you meet so many characters and there's so many interesting types of things going on. And then I worked there. Then I worked as a, uh, at a ping pong bar owned by Susan Saranda called spin. And then I worked as a, uh, uh, a model for ultrasound machines. So I was like, a I was like, a uh, a test patient for surgeons who were renewing their doctoral licenses so that they can go and work in as a surgeon or a doctor. So they had to take this 10 day seminar on how to, <laughs> it's so funny in retrospect, they had to take this seminar on how to learn how to use the latest versions of ultrasound. So I would lay on this mat with my shirt off and they put petroleum jelly. And so I learned all about the inner workings of ultrasound and how the radio waves bounce to the back and bounce to the front and all these crazy things. And they were so nice and 
It was so interesting to hear doctors and surgeons speak this whole other language. It felt like about the intricacies of the inner body and how it works and how it moves and 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 seeing my own insides on a chat on a on a screen and a guy telling me, oh, it looks like this is in good, good condition. Um and because I didn't smoke, they're like your lines, the lining on your lungs look fantastic. And they were such a great conversationalist. Um, and then from there, I worked as an indoor bocce ball coach, teaching corporate parties how to play bocce ball, wow. and like an ambassador. So it was like, uh, all right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to blah, blah, blah. I loved that job. That was so much fun. And then uh, it was the then after that, I think we worked a little bit on league together yep. or on battleground. And then I worked on, um, worked from for two years after that at unity. Oh, cool. <laughs> That's been great. And ever since then I've been just chilling. So, but, um, and now I'm making films. So this is, this is where I'm at. That's so, crazy. You had so many like interesting jobs. Um, that's yeah, that's cool. It makes you, makes you a, more well-rounded person it adds experiences that you can draw from like i was a barista at one point it's kind of probably a little similar to being a, a bartender you meet lots of interesting people you're like making drinks and teaching you some some good skills i was a custodian um that's I mean, great dude yeah that was one of my favorite jobs <laughs> like just putting on my headphones just vacuuming just oh hell yeah dude <laughs> listen to all the podcasts <laughs> yep. um, oh i worked with the uh oh sorry continue continue my bad go ahead go ahead no i was i was gonna ask another question so you you finish oh i worked at this place this place was so funny i worked as a uh this place called red blend studio with these other concept artists this place was crazy um and uh it was this it was this they hired me because they wanted somebody who can make their paintings or sorry their photos look like oil paintings so that they could sell them to people like it's like a conversion to oil painting or whatever but they had this real shtick about like they wanted people to know that when they came in that people were actually like painting their family portraits digitally by hand like on a single layer, like they would scumble, like they made me like put an underpainting and then like underpainting burnt sienna drawing and then like paint it all on top and scumble it and do all these things. And I had to use these very specific brushes and then they would print them out, put them on a canvas, stretch them. And then I had to like paint it by hand and, and make it look like this whole oil painting instead of just painting it in oil. Oh <laughs> them, but they had this whole business. And I quit there because I had my first, uh, like, I don't have anxiety really, like, like not too much. Like I don't, I don't, uh, it's not bad or anything like that. But I remember sitting in my office painting alone. And I remember feeling like I'm sinking in my chair. I've never felt this feeling in my life. That was the only time I've ever felt it. It felt like I was sinking. And there was water like like slowly coming up on me and my chest felt very heavy. And then that day I quit because I, I said, I don't know what that was, but it has to do with this place and I can't be here anymore. Like I can't work um, here. Like I can't be, this isn't who I'm supposed to be and what I'm meant to be. And this is like something's going, my body is telling me to leave or something is telling me to get out of here. And I went in that day and I, I told them that I couldn't do it. I said, I have to quit. I'm sorry. But uh, this was 2017 or 18. I'll never forget that feeling. That was the only time I've ever felt that way. Like a, like a drowning feeling. It, it was so surreal. Like I got disassociated. I was like, whoa. And I felt like I was outside my body, but I was drowning. And, and then I was looking at myself and I was like, whoa, I cannot, I cannot be here at all. Absolutely nuts. That's crazy. So you think it's um, something with the job, like, like um, 
yeah, obviously something with the job, but um, probably like a greater, like, this isn't what I want to be doing with my life. And it kind of like hit you. Yes. Yes. It was, um, it was, um, the history of my life was so much more exciting than that. And I said to myself, if this is it, if this is what I'll be doing, I can't because it just feels like death. I'm like, this feels like, because it was in Richmond Hill, it was like North Ontario and it was a quiet neighborhood and it was all industrial, but it was like industrial, clean industrialism. Like it was like yeah, all these brick and mortar buildings and it was just, it was, it was hell on earth. And I remember just seeing my life flashing before my eyes. I'm like, okay, this is where I'm going to be forever. And then that made me sink. And I immediately quit. I was like, there's no way I could ever do that. I, there's no amount of money you could pay me to sit in a room like that and do that ever again. I was there for seven months or eight months or something or something like that. And I just, I hated it. Even though I learned, I never grinded so hard in my life, though. I learned so much about painting at that job. <laughs> I learned so, I grinded so, it was like eight and a half to 12 hours a day of pure digital focus painting, like nothing else. Like I was, I was, I was just in the zone. Like, and I remember being like, no way, no way. Yeah. Um, Beside, oh, um, Unity, you, so you worked at Unity. How was, how was that experience? You worked on one game there? I worked on a lot of projects there. Um, I worked on, I don't know if I'm allowed to say it. I should be allowed to say it. Has a trailer come out or anything? No, no, nothing has come out. Um, maybe, all maybe don't say anything. So they all got, um, they all got canned. Um, oh. Well, if they're if they're canceled, sometimes you can say, "Do you know?" I think it's fine. I think it's fine. I was working on um, this game that was about uh, it was meant for ravers. I actually worked with this guy named Peter Rubin, one of the greatest guys I've ever worked with. Is he was an art director for he was the art director for um, Independence Day. I think it was back in the day. Like he's done everything. That's and awesome. With my first art director. And it was so crazy how he hired me. We were sitting. I was like sitting in an interview or whatever. Dude, it was so crazy. I was on my last paycheck. I was working as a cook, uh, like down my street here. And I was just in such a, I had just moved to Montreal for a contract at, um, I'm not going to tell the, the company because it's not their fault, but um, my contract got liquidated. Like they didn't end up hiring me, but I had already moved here and I've already made all the decisions and they were like sorry no and so um i had to find work because i literally moved here with nothing and so i worked as a cook at this place called evidence i was like a brunch chef and uh i would work fucking 7 a.m to like 7 p.m i was working like so many hours prepping and doing all these things and the entire menu is in french and i don't speak french so i had to like decipher the the, the whole thing and and so um I remember paying my rent with my credit card and being so depleted and being like, fuck, like I'm screwed. And then out of nowhere, Unity calls me. Like the the Claire Inglis, she's fantastic. She was like a talent acquisitor. And she's like, hey, um, uh, we saw your portfolio online and we thought you were like a great fit. And I don't even think I even applied for this. I think they just found me. And uh, they're like, we thought you'd be a great fit. Like, um, how would you feel to have an interview? And I'm like, of course, like, of course, I'd love to have an interview. And so we set up an interview and the, the screen opens up like this, like a Zoom. And there's this big guy and he's like this. He's like huge. And he has like he's classic, like Hollywood cigar, like type guy. And he's like, uh, Mr. Reed. And I'm like, yes. He's like, uh, I like your work. I like everything about it. Do you want to start next week? That's all he said. And I'm like, uh, OK, I'm like, yes. And then Claire was in the meeting with us, the the woman who who brought me into the the meeting, and she's like, uh, 
She's like, but Peter, he has all these, we have all these people we have to talk to. Like, we, we, we can't just like do that. And uh, he's like, basically it's like, shush. And he, she, he says, Mr. Reed, do you want to start next week? And I'm like, yes. And she's like, he's like, book it, stamp it, put him through. He's starting next week. And I'm like, oh my God. And I started that next week and we worked on a, this project together. And he was crazy. He would call me on, dude, he would call me on Sunday. Like, I, I don't know what he was on, but he would call me on Sunday and be like, we got a project on Monday. We got to have a pitch meeting by 9 a.m. I'm sorry to do this to your kid. He like gave me his, his like WhatsApp or whatever. Uh -huh. And he would call me so early and be like, we need you to do uh, 15 paintings uh, for the, for this pitch. Can you do it? And I'm like, dude, I don't know. It's like already 5 p.m. He's like, what if you pour a cup of coffee? Can you do it? And I'm like, yeah, I can do it. And I did it. And I remember staying up until like, he called me at like 5 p.m. Staying up till like 7 a.m. or whatever it is. And I finished all this work. And I was so tired. But I don't know why I was so proud. Like I was like, I wanted to, to do so much good for him and be like, I, 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 he was so passionate about it too. And I don't know, we had a great relationship, but um, he ended up getting fired for mistreating employees, which I'm not surprised about, but, but uh, he was, he was such a, I, he was such a great guy. I think he was great, but, um, but uh, that place the projects we worked on, we worked on some stuff for the LAX. We worked on this really interesting project for the Cincinnati hospital. Um, they were building this program for VR that was about um, surgeons who wanted to test practice heart surgeries. And they would um, use the specific sizes and measurements of people's hearts and their build and 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 the, and their reports, and be able to work from home with VR to do test scaling and to do to do um, test surgeries or how to do um, uh, measurements for valves and uh, different types of pipings that would go into the the different branches of the heart. And I learned so much on that project. Like, how would that look? How would um, you know what would these valves be? What's so intuitive? Like. It was it was really interesting, but a lot of tech projects, like not yeah. a lot of video games and not a lot of art, surprisingly, huh. which was which was crazy. But I, I worked with I would work with some really great artists though, but um, yeah, everyone we all got laid off there, so it was pretty crazy. Wow, they just they just canned the whole art department. Yeah, they 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 had a crazy like uh pro they let go of like eight hundred people one day and then like a thousand people the next day they let go of like twenty percent of their entire um company. Wow, sounds that like shot. Netflix. Oh, yo, for real? Yeah, it's uh, bad out there right now. It's another big reason why I went to film was just concept art as a. Custom art as a role is just too toxic. It's too volatile, way too volatile. And I just, uh, I'd rather make paintings on my own, not work for a company that, that, you know, could let me go at any moment, you know, have the reliability of a team. And, you know, I'd rather be the head of something than, than the body. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you, you definitely have like the the personality and and drive and vision for that. Um, so yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be cool to see what you do. No, I'm so excited. Yeah. I'm so amped. I can't wait. Just when do you? Sorry, go ahead. May May fifth and sixth is when I start filming. So okay, so filming soon, and then do you? Um, when do you want to release something? Do you, you gonna do like a little trailer or yeah well i'll try to do the whole thing it's a 10 minute short and it's i'm gonna try to i want to get it in on festival season so i think finishing it before june wrapping it up um uh, but i want to do a really good job i have like some sound design work that i really want to include and there's there's a lot that I, that needs to be done making a film is a lot of work i didn't realize but 
every part of the process is so much fun and there's it's it's incredibly liberating like to make a piece of work and and it be yours and it going your way even though it's bad at the end let's say at least i learn at least i can admit to myself that i can a work on it and make it better the next time and take everything i didn't learn and b that it's a lot harder than i thought and then i could you know have some forgiveness for the industry and their visions and their ideas and hopefully go back to it but honestly writing a script i was like and finishing a script i was like what are these people thinking this is the easiest thing in the world i'm like making something that is awesome on paper was so much easier than i thought like uh, or something that hasn't been done before or whatever it is but uh, maybe that just comes from a love of film i don't know but we're genuinely wanting to make something beautiful instead of wondering what makes money i think that's that's also a big indicator or a big factor mm -hmm. we'll see until it gets made we have no idea yet so it's all up in the air yeah so besides jujitsu working out um what other like non-art um hobbies do you have what do you do to like refresh <laughs> bang my head against the wall no i'm just kidding <laughs> um i love hanging out with my friends i love getting dinner with them i love going to life draw i mean that's art related actually life drawing is so much fun um i love playing golf golf season is coming up oh so much fun have you ever played golf I did a little bit in high school and currently uh, I've been playing uh, Mario golf with my brother and sister. <laughs> <laughs> That's the same thing, dude. That's the same yeah. thing. <laughs> Do you like Mario golf? It's so much fun. eh? I love it. It's so chill. Like we just, we make some, like my sister will make like boba tea and then uh, we just, yeah, we just play. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> and then like i love i love my friends and i will book a cottage and we'll go every few months together and we'll play mario golf and it's so much fun to like just crap on somebody else with an ability like you know some guys playing in the field you just land a bomb and just shoots his ball way out the other way uh -huh. it is the greatest thing ever just such a fun game i find it's incredibly forgiving though like you you can like it always goes right down the middle and right to the spot that you wanted to go. And it's, it's fun, but yeah. If something other, another thing I've been doing, I've been, man, I've been running a lot, running a lot recently. Um, there's something I've been doing. I guess writing, writing doesn't count as, as a, it's that's an artistic that's still in the art realm i guess yeah yeah it's different though it's like it you're not like um you're away from your tablet i guess <laughs> <laughs> your stylus isn't in your hand <laughs> it is it's always in my it's always up here though <laughs> yeah. um let's see i've been doing a lot of reading actually i've been reading this book called the splendid exchange and it's about the trade of the world and, and its origins, starting with the Stone Age and working to the Sumerians and to the Roman Empire, all the way to the this empire and this empire and this empire. And it kind of gets all the way to mo the modern era and the currency exchange and, and the stock market and, and the, the bubble and all these things. And it's super fascinating to learn about. Like, I, I'm also late to reading, like I really started to find joy in it in my 20s. Like when I was a teenager and when I was younger, I just couldn't get into it. But something about learning about history specifically and their stories are so captivating. Like there's a saying, uh, kids who are into sci-fi uh, become historians when they're older. And, and it makes sense because sci good sci-fi and its storytelling, its origins are based in history, um, which is super fascinating. I didn't really know that. And then the more I read about history, the more I could put the both together, the two together. And, and um, 
it's it's unbelievable like i was i was also reading this other book i it's hard for me to always like finish one i read like two at the same time i'm reading another one called the last days of the incas by stephen mccrory and it's about the the incan empire and how it came to fruition and how the the spanish inquisition came over and they got conquered and and the and altupa the 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 leader of the the empire at the time and and how he came to power and huscar and Hernando Pissarro and all these all these characters and the way that these stories are tell, told are so beautiful and they're so uh they're obviously exaggerated because they're told by historians that are like really uh looking out for the other guy but it's interesting how that empire was even discovered like there was a guy who was in the empire who never learned how to read or write because that's just not how they were raised or how they how what they learned um especially in what was it 500 bc or something like that or and so when the spanish inquisition came over they taught them pen and ink because previously they had a system called quipu so they learned with knotted rope so essentially um when they wanted to pick time or a place or a person they would be on this circlet of knots extruding from the circlet would be a knot that would say time place where when and then there would be a guy within their tribe that would decipher it for them so he would be like the cartographer of um the incans so when the spanish inquisition came over they taught them pen and ink and um so there's a lady like recording me outside this is really funny um she's looking through your window yeah she's She waved back. No, she she's with her dog. I think she's I think she's aiming it at me, but it but I think she's like it's like selfie mode. Uh, and then when I went to wave, she just like continued to walk away. <laughs> but um so when they brought over ink and quill, one of the guys decided to write this entire, I guess not necessarily manifesto, but a, a historical report on his culture and his people to send to the Spanish king to tell them like, yo, stop pillaging our people. Like this sucks. Um, and so when he finished the book, he had sent it on a boat to get, to be sent back to Spain, but it got lost and ended up in Copenhagen like 500 years later. And some guy found it in this book, in this chest and found the entire history of the Incan empire, then went to the Andes and discovered all of these like old rubbled and destructed like this destroyed place in Cusco and Lima and, and all this like broken down remains of this like skeletal empire and it was and that's how it all began it's pretty crazy and that's I didn't realize like things like that can be converted into sci-fi and it's just super interesting how you can put that all into concept art and bring it all back to you and but um, yeah, those are the things that's, I guess, the only other outside thing that I'm doing right now besides uh, besides jujitsu and uh, and uh, hanging out with my friends and concept art. <laughs> yeah. And movies. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, how do you feel about college? Did you have a good college experience? Yeah, yeah, I really... I, I liked college, but it, I also was pretty absent. Um, I think I was like a, it's like a delinquent when I was young. Like I was really um just a bad kid. And so I wouldn't even up to college. Like I just wouldn't go to school. I went because my parents told me to. And then um, it's crazy because it was coming out of my own pocket. But um, I would always go to OCAD and kind of hang out with my friends there. But the teachers I did have at Centennial taught me so much, man. Like the times that I were there, the wisdom that they brought onto me was incredible. I had a teacher named Dalibor Dejovanik. I think you might know him. Uh, he does these really beautiful pastel plein air paintings. And he'll submit them every year. And he always comes like first or second place. He's, he's unbelievable. And... He taught me so much about how light works and chroma and how 
just how to draw from life correctly and how to um, experience things. And he was such a great guy to always go to if I was feeling stuck in life. Like uh, I had some very great teachers that were always really good to have one-on-ones on. Like I, I, if I'm having a hard time in life, like I'll invite an old teacher out and we'll go and play in our draw or something like that. And I'll talk to them for a few hours about what's going on in my life or what's happening. And they always tell me the best things I could always hear. Like they could always give you the best advice. Um, but he's a fantastic person. Uh, Matt Lyon was my animation teacher and he said something to me I'll never forget in my whole life. And this is something that I think every anyone can use. Whenever you make something or you do something, it's always better to overshoot and dial back than to start from the beginning and dial forward. And that that stuck with me. I, I once I heard once I, that clicked. I always thought of that anytime I go and do something, I overshoot it. I'll, I'll like do something so crazy and out there and then I'll dial it back to something more rational and more calm. And I, even with writing or whatever it is, and the product always comes out more amazing that way. And you get you out, you get all of you out as opposed to giving out a little bit and then always wondering if there was more. But if you give the maximum, if you go, okay, I'm going to go all the way with this. And then you dial it back. Now, you know, it's a, it's a game of what's to be removed. And he, he said it in such a more, he said it in such an elegant way, like I'm butchering it, but those experiences alone and some of the stuff I've learned and other things that I've learned were so valuable that that's what made college worth it. But other than that, the actual curriculum itself and the work that I made there and the time that I had there um, wasn't the greatest but it was totally worth the trade-off. Like I made a lifelong um, resonating like ideologies from that, that I take with my life every day. So it was a trade-off. It's kind of like a double-edged sword. Like I, I, I learned all these amazing things from such talented people, but I learned absolutely nothing in my own industry. <laughs> so it was a, it was a, it was a trade, but uh I'd say for anybody who wants to go to college, though, I think today, if you want to go to college for concept art, I don't think um, I don't think you have to. I don't think you you need to at all. I don't think it's necessary. I think for art in general, I don't think it's necessary to go to school. I think the resources are online you can get for free are so crazy. It's 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 all laid out for you. Like anything you need to know about anything is 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 all laid right out like. I, I had one digital painting class in 2015 that was like three weeks and then the rest is self-taught. So, um, you know, you don't need it. If you're passionate about it enough and you love it, you really, you really, really don't need to go to school. Um, it's a waste of money and it's kind of a waste of your time. And you should spend that time, especially those young years, like experiencing it. And like having fun and learning who you are and learning what you like to make. And I find school like will beat that out of you. It'll be like, no, you need to know this, that, and the other. And you, if you want to get a job, you need to do this. If you want to make money and survive, like you need to do this. And it's, it's not a, it's not healthy, especially for the arts. I understand for business and science and whatever it is, it makes sense, but not for painting. Yeah. hundred percent agree. You know, um, a lot of people sent in questions and stuff, and a lot of them were related to like your art process and how you come up with ideas and, and things like that. So I, I, have, I have a bunch of like art painting questions for you. Okay. Um, can you talk about your process a little bit? Um, like, what are you thinking when you're painting, creating an image? Um, like you, I, I know you talked about it a little bit already, like maybe, maybe you fill up a few pages of writing first or, or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hold on. Let me just turn on the light one second. Sorry. 
Yeah, Hold go on. ahead. Run the light. Sorry. It gets it, it gets dark in here. Yeah. So, um. Way better. Um. The the process. It starts usually with an image, so it'll start with um. A feeling. And then that feeling. Like an image in your head or a photo or what do you mean? Yeah, it, it, it's kind of already done. Like it, it it comes fully baked. Like it'll be a fully finished image. And then the next stage is to draw it crudely. So I'll draw a really crude image of what it looks like. Kind of like the shit that's behind me. Like these, these are all actually my friends. Like we all just. Oh, uh, cool. Like, I was going to ask. Like a drop board. And um, the image will be. It's, it'll be like super crude but the composition will all be there like it'll just be a few lines and maybe a couple circles and spheres and whatever whatever kind of establishes the form and the idea and i'll do maybe three or four iterations of that and then from there i'll just throw a bunch of pictures in so i'll make a tiny thumb that's like maybe this big this is the new this is a process that i'm working on right now it's different but it's different every it's different like every couple of weeks like i don't really do the same thing uh, all the time uh from there i'll i'll build it up with a light wash so i'll do like a it's like a light underpainting and then a few pictures and then i'll compile sometimes the entire thing with all photographs and then i'll i'll just mute it all make it all one mid-tone and then i'll just add lights and shadows and whatever it is um and then from there i'll save that composition and then i'll make an entirely new painting that is a higher definition version of that one and then i'll rebuild it with an articulated drawing and then an articulated form but i maintain the compositional placements and so i'll do that um but again this all starts in the writing it's weird it's kind of hard to explain like it, it it starts like a fever like do you ever have that like it comes out like a fever dream like it's you have the idea you sit down you go into a trance for like six or seven hours or eight hours you come out and then it's done doesn't that ever, does, isn't that kind of how it happens? Sometimes, like, yeah. It's kind of a different experience every time. Yeah, you enter like a different world. You're like, holy crap, I'm in like, I'm on like another planet. And it, it you come back and it's, it's laid out in front of you. And, but I've been using a lot of references of uh, early 2000s cyber Y2K, um, like footage from like PlayStation two games. Like, like I'll, I'll save cinematics from like PlayStation two games. Like I'll take like final fantasy or even PlayStation one, I'll take like final fantasy eight cinematics and I'll save them and I'll save a compilation of them and rework them as mats. Like I'll take them all apart and completely sh take them to shreds and I'll save each element out. So I'll save like a character element, repaint them entirely. And then I'll use them as composites for the next thing. Or sometimes I'll do what's called an image to image. So I, people are going to get mad at this one. People might get a little mad at this one. <laughs> uh, Go for it. I've built, I'm in the process of making my own diffusion model. And so I've used a lot of my own, I've built the model off of my own paintings throughout the years. And so sometimes I'll get composites from there and I'll rework them and rebuild them and develop some interesting styles from there and, try to work the crunch factor and and try to mess around with different with different edge formings and different photo manipulation tools from different programs. I'll import them into other programs and bring them back. Um, sometimes I like to use Rebel, then bring it from Rebel to Photoshop, then from there to, you know, whatever other program. Sometimes even drop it into MS Paint, paint over it with a, with a blocky brush, bring it back into Photoshop. Start with Kipix Studios, bring from Kipix Studios to Photoshop, like just whatever, whatever does something wacky or funky that I can learn from to put into my toolbox to add to the next one. Um, there's two modes that I kind of separate myself by. 
there's like playtime sandbox mode where I experiment. All I do is like put a bunch of random stuff together or I'll, I'll really um, make an incoherent mess, like things that just don't make sense. And then I'll have a separate box where I take all the things that worked and I put them in. And then that's where I make my final paintings. So that's where I'll make something that's like commissioned or something for work or something that I have an idea of that, that is makes a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. But the whole purpose of the sandbox area is to learn tools and ideas that evoke the correct emotion for a particular vision. So, you know, especially how form turns over, I learned that if you want to paint something that is from the early 2000s, you want to paint like Y2K stuff, you get a soft brush, you set it to color dodge and you apply it to a local color. You you now have a default RGB uh, rendering system. So like you can you can do stuff like that. And then when you go into your shadows, you put on multiply and, and you, you go to the blacks instead of going into the cools because old modeling systems never had HDR lighting. They had like just straight to black. So that's how you get that, that really nice um, old feeling. So now you understand that, right? So now let's use HDR lighting and let's use contemporary editions of like Mullen style and apply it to that. So that's what I that's what I've been doing for the past few paintings is taking early two thousands rendering styles and systems and 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 the modern kind of uh, zeitgeist of what's in what I think is cool and interesting and apply old contemporary ideas to them so i take like you know a, a whatever um uh final fantasy 10 ideas and then i just mollify them like i turn them into like a mullen style-esque painting like that's that's the the point but you know that that process the only reason why it's hard to replicate is because it's so wacky like it's 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 gonzo like it's it's you can't you're you're relying on a lot of intuition and a lot of um what feels right as opposed to what is right um they're both happening at the same time it's it's like emotion and logic at once and you're getting like your intuition so like my emotion is telling me that the form should turn this way the logic is telling me that it will turn this way but you know when it's together it's going to make something a little bit different and it's always hard to, that's why it's always hard for me to articulate the process is because each painting requires something different. Like, uh, especially if you're relying on feeling and what an audience sh can feel right, and how they should feel about something and trying to make them feel a certain way. So those are things I think about very early on, like in the, before I even start painting is like, how is, what is this painting going to feel like? When you the first shot of when you look at it with your eyes, what is the what is the hit? And there's a whole foundation within that that is that is interesting. But we would be here for so long talking about it. We would be here for hours and hours. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I love the like experimentation, um, and just not being afraid to just try a bunch of crazy stuff um it's so important because we can get like stuck in a process that works and then um we don't grow as much we kind of create the same image over and over again so yeah it's something i love about your work yes sir the um what uh, what about color um you have like some pretty crazy like wacky color choices um how do you choose colors? Um, I don't think they're that wacky. Are they that wacky? They're not mm -hmm. that wacky. They're they're unique. When I see your stuff, I'm like, that's a weird color combination. I didn't think about that. Because for me, it's like I choose colors. Like I'll be like, okay, reality, and then what's like a heightened reality or like a pushed reality. Um, so it like starts there, and then I I push it a little bit. Um. There's, these are more based off dreams. So they're not based off of um, reality. Like I, I very much am a huge believer in visions and dreams and they are like reality, 
but I also see in the camera sense of it. So like, I don't, I try to be like a camera, like every time I have a dream, it's always like first person and there's like a bloom to it. And I never think about color. That's the only thing, but, but I'm also colorblind. So it doesn't, it doesn't, so it's, it's, I have, I have a Newton color blindness, so I can't, I can't see the certain hues and variations and stuff like that. So maybe that's another reason, Wow. but, um, so Is it certain colors you can't see or how much can you not see? uh, like 25%, like 30% or something like that. I have Dutton, so I can't see, I can't see red, like, uh, pink and blues, like certain blues and pinks. So they just come out as gray. So I can't really, I don't know if you guys see them or not. I have no idea. But my value ranges, it makes my value ranges better because I, it was my lack of color. So I'm always value first anyways. So the reasons why the color choices work is because the values are correct. And th that's usually the, the, the big indicator, but temperature wise, it also doesn't really matter too much. <clears throat> but um, I just go off feeling a lot. And I think it's also mileage. But because um, I used to follow a very specific routine of what works and what's based off reality. But once I started to riff into what I saw in my dreams and in my head more, and I made that connection stronger by writing them down or focusing on them or whatever, the compositions in my paintings started to take a big turn. Like once I started to be more honest with it and less care, caring about what is like right, because you realize there is no right. There is no right, there is no right color composition. Like you, everyone has their reality and their version of reality. And um, yeah, you could paint it accurately, but all we're, if, if you can, then like, and, and we're riffing just a little bit from that, that's beautiful. But for me, I, it's not enough. Like I, I, The, the dreams and the visions are so much more different than that. And that's where my goal is. And for some reason, it I don't know, it's, it's hard to articulate. Like, I just take the picture that's in my head and try to match it onto the canvas. Hmm. Using that by finding references that match it and other things that match it. And then I get closer and closer and closer. And then as the painting starts to work more and more, I use my emotion and my intuition to... To, to riff riff into something that that pushes the envelope of what that vision originally was but I try really hard to stay accurate to what that picture was like especially with the clone of a clone series I had a the vision in my mind the picture was um this guy who just duplicated himself in a like a caged room and it was like a experiment with these monkeys, but he was by himself. Like, like PETA had, or like PETA had like shut down the entire thing. And so it was just him and the experiments that he had remaining. And so he tested it on himself and he duplicated himself in this enclosed abandoned area. And he stuck having these conversations with himself and he gets so overly, um, enveloped in this in the people that he's made that he builds these hobbies with them and lives this little world with them and that's all I saw and the colors and the rest of that is just part of the vision like I've never never thought about the the decisions behind them I think the naivety of my decisions is what makes them maybe perhaps um interesting but I don't know anything about what's right or what's wrong in painting and I think maybe that's why they look crazy or whatever it is. It's just, no one's ever told me, like I've never had any formal training. So it's like, <laughs> it's like, uh, I'm going off of what feels right and what looks cool. Like I, I uh, but sometimes I wonder like for a long time when there was no, odd, like nobody looking, I was like, man, am I doing this right? Like this looks, <laughs> I like it, but I'm like, does anybody like this? <laughs> and I just didn't care. So I just kind of maintained the same thing. I'm like, I guess I was on the right path, but 
Yeah, definitely. I'm also jealous that you can have dreams and remember them like vividly. Is that like every night you have dreams? No, uh, it's about like once a month, I'll have a really vivid one. The, the vividness comes from just sometimes it's just the image in my head while I'm walking or like just being around or existing. Like it's just the, the picture so clear. It's so clear and it's so real that um, sometimes it hurts not to put it down. But, but um, the dreams that are vivid, I do write them down right after to maintain them or they will go away. Um, like I'll forget about them later that day. But some are so strong, well, I'll never forget. Like I had this one recently. Actually, this wasn't a dream. This was, I was at a park. I was like sitting on a bench with a friend and the, I'll give you an example of how, how it kind of goes. Like you'll just be sitting or walking or whatever it is. And it'll be like a flash. It's like, it's like a, it's like a two second flash and it pops in and out. And then what you do is you try to catch the flash. Like you go back in your head a little bit and you're like, what was, what, what was that image? And then you, you rest on it. It's David Lynch talks about, it. it's like fishing. Like you're, you're constantly like, like ideas come to you. You don't make them right. Like, like a chef, like he catches a, he prepares the fish. He doesn't claim that he made the fish. Right. Um, ideas are kind of like that. Like they enter your space and then it's your job to catch them and then, and then riff with them and, and build them and turn them into a world and expand them. And there's incredible value to it. And I believe that they're so strong. Like, so this one I had, I was sitting at a park bench and it was an image. Actually, I'm t I told this to a girl I'm seeing recently, like she, she loved this story, but uh, it's this man and he's floating in the air and he's surrounded by metal scaffolding all around him in like a white space. And uh, he's wearing a canvas jacket with canvas pants, like tan canvas. And on the center is a square piece of plastic, like laminated onto the canvas jacket. And the gravity is low and there's air bubbles coming out of his nose because of the pressure from the gravity that's pushing out the water that's in his body. And his head is like a peach, like his body, his hands are so swollen because he's over hydrated for some reason. Like he's been filled with water and in front of him is this door, this big bronze door and, or brass, sorry. And uh, underneath it is a smaller door. And the smaller door opens from his point of view. And there's these two kinetic magnets. I don't know if you know what therapy magnets are. You know, the oblong little magnets. And you throw them together and they go when they um. when they connect. Um, so these two oblong magnets are spinning and spinning and spinning in this little spot. And <clears throat> like toy race cars, they come racing in front of him. And they plant themselves. And there's still spinning and connecting and disconnecting and doing what magnets do. And then they both go vertical on the spot. And the small arms and the small legs protrude from their form that they're already made of. And they plant themselves. And these small little mouths come out of them, like this, like it, from their form, and it opens up and down. And when they were speaking to each other, this is as I was telling my friend we thought it'd be a game to try to like i i stopped him and i was like i have this idea and then we we just kept going and it just kept coming out and coming sometimes it'll just keep coming out and as they spoke to each other they didn't speak a human language like they didn't speak english or spanish or whatever it is they spoke like compactors crushing like the sounds of metal compactors crushing up and down like the contrast or the juxtaposition of these like little tiny magnet creatures having these enormous voices. And then there was like these glowing subtitles about what they should would do with this guy that they have like imprisoned. They're like prison guards, these like tiny little magnets. And um, one of them opens their mouth and spits out a red cube, like a small red cube that's made of uh, 
like a sh very shiny metal. Like, I, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's like a shiny little metal cube. Um, spits it out. It rolls on the ground. And then they go back into their little forms. By the way, when they shrink into their forms, it even made the sound of Rubik's cubes when you move Rubik's cubes around. And they went back into their form, reconnected, and then like race cars went through the little door. The little door shut. They exited. The cube being on the ground was a gravity modifier. It removed the gravity kind of debuff that was in the air, and the guy fell. Now, when the man fell, he fell to the ground, and he started to sink through this like concrete floor. And when he sunk through, he fell through to another side on his living room couch. And from his living room couch, he had like someone ring at the doorbell. And it was a, it was like a guy, like an Uber Eats driver delivering him ramen. And the guy says, how's your day? And then the character who fell through the floor doesn't respond. And he says, my day was great. And then he, instead of walking back to his car, the driver, he teleports to the front of his car door, like the, the door driver side, teleports inside the car. Like it was, it, it was as if there was no frames, like the frames were removed when he went between the, the thing, went in his car and then the car vanished. And then the door closes and that was like the end of the dream or the end of the sequence. Yeah, and I was like, you know, I don't know what that was, but it stuff like that is how then I go and make a painting from. You're a freak. Bro, I, I know. That's crazy. I know. Sometimes it's bad. Like I'll have a lot of stuff like that where it just will will it'll complete. Like it'll just like it'll it'll go all the way. It has like a it has like a a story or whatever it is to it, but being a fan, I think of art and film and cinema. Like it, it got built into my, into my imagination somehow. Like it got, it got like a something. I don't know. But that's that's kind of how that's how the visions kind of form. Yeah. And then I'll pick that. But. Man, I'm even more excited to hear, like, see like the stuff that you create. Like, <laughs> yeah, man, that's that's cool. Uh, <laughs> Cause that that's like very very unique to you. Like I don't I don't ever have dream. Like I have like one dream a year maybe, and it's just like real life, and it's it's like a depressing version of real life for some reason. It'll be <laughs> like like one time I had a dream a couple years ago that uh, one of my childhood friends um, he snuck into my. Uh, apartment when I was out of town and he stole my guitars um and I like I wake up and um like the dream was so realistic that I like went I, I went to the other room and like made sure my guitars were still there <laughs> and it was like I I was mad at my my friend for a long time because like, I was like, that's something he would do. He would just come and, like, steal my stuff and then, like, <laughs> but, yeah. Man. <laughs> man, I found, I have friends, I always ask my friends, like, dreams where a friend, like, messes with you or, like, something happened and you wake up and you almost have, like, you're upset at them, but they didn't do anything. But you're, like, you have, like, your perspective where something has changed about them. Yeah. It's always funny. Yeah, like I won't, but, I won't like text them back for a while, and then I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry, I, you were <laughs> you're an asshole in my dream, so I was pissed at you for a for a little bit. Oh my god, you sound like my girlfriend. Oh my god, like, <laughs> like, dude, <laughs> like, it's funny how you have these things that happen at night, you mm -hmm. have no control over. Yeah. You have control of your whole life. You know, you have control of when you wake up, you go to your job, you have your control of when you, what time you want to eat, what time you want to go to bed. But there, there's eight hours of this isn't your choice. Here's a here's a movie that you are not allowed to. Uh, here's like a, a first person experienced film that you can't have any decision over. And it's thrown in your face until you wake up that you believe is real the whole time. Oh, it's it's actually hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Your poor friend. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I know. <laughs> oh, man. Did you go to your guitars and we're like, oh, one, two, three, four, five. You're like, oh, thank God. You're like, yeah. oh, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're all there. And the worst ones are like dreams where, oh, man, we're like, your pants are missing and you're in and you're in elementary school or something and it's like you're looking for your pants i've always had those ones or like oh, yeah. pulling out the stress dreams or like the oh like just anxiety dreams are the worst ones ever the yeah. worst um something something that i've been getting better with and something that like doing this podcast with and like talking with other artists um it's it's helped me with with some things like taking myself out of my artwork a little bit like not putting my entire like self-worth into like creating a good piece of artwork and i think i think just this week just just the past couple of days I've been like really excited and I find I found joy in just the process of creating, um, which I never really had before. Um, I put so much pressure on like finishing a piece and making like, you know, the beautiful painting or whatever, but I don't know, something like changed in my head this week where I'm just like, Oh, I've got like a couple different, environments to design like i'm just so excited to like go through this process and discover something um mm -hmm. i don't know just just for myself i was i was like man i feel so much better <laughs> it's like a a simple thing but <laughs> talking you... to people <laughs> it helps me <laughs> yeah <laughs> i know right oh my god dude <laughs> but, um, do you do you find like the joy in the process yes yeah if, if it's something that i can make myself excited about yeah like but when it's something i really don't want to do i can't but again like i cut out all the stuff i don't want to do so it, it 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 solved itself but the last time that's happened this is something that's universal i think that's happened it happens to me i think it happens to everyone where if there's something you're not excited about the work almost comes out shittier like anytime you're not like have you ever had a, a like a family member ask you for a commission when you were young yeah. you know when you're like 16 17 and they ask you like can you draw my wedding portrait or whatever yeah and it just comes out like ass like it just looks so bad and you're like man this fucking sucked because you hated doing it the whole time you're like as you're drawing it, you're almost like, man, fuck this. Like, I don't want to draw this person. This person sucks. Like, whatever. And it's like that with a project. Like, if you're not, if you can't even hype yourself up about it, oof, it's so it's so hard to sit through and do and, and maximize. Like, I bet the environments you were making that you could really warm yourself up to and 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 find love. And I bet you they came out, like, way better than some of the things you beat yourself up about maybe yeah yeah i think i'm doing like the best work that i've ever done um i'm so much more efficient too like um i think um uh just letting a painting letting a, a sketchy painting just be a sketchy painting and i know like all my stuff is like pretty loose and everything but um, I think I'm just exploring and and just letting um, just letting it be like okay, I had the idea, I explore that idea, I just put put the marks down, sketch in, I just like capture the feeling I'm going for, capture the the characters, the poses, and then I just leave it. I'm getting better, at just like leaving it, and then doing the next idea and maybe maybe you helped me a little bit with this like writing things down because i've been like i write in my sketchbook all these like ideas so then i kind of have like a deadline for myself it's like okay i've got like 10 ideas that i want to do this week 
so I can't render all of them. I just, I just have to get them out really fast. Um, mm -hmm. That's, that's the way to do it. I think too much purity can hurt your work. Like when it's, when it's, there's an art to stopping a piece and moving on. And when something's finished, that comes from, I think, mileage and painting a lot. But it, it also like having a future thing, you're like, okay, I finished this because I have something else to move on to. But when you don't set yourself up for the next pin to be knocked down, you just spend time on that one painting and you're like, I gonna, I'm gonna add this, that, and the other, and this, this, is it. and then you overwork it and it gets over rendered and the readability gets fucked up and you're like, oh God, why did I continue this for another three hours? It was done an hour ago. Like, oh man, but writing, I found, I'm glad that helped though. Like writing the ideas and you never think you have that kind of influence. It's interesting. Like sometimes I, I, I'll put stuff in that discord and I'll just leave a paragraph of information thinking you guys go like, oh, Daniel. Yo, Daniel, shut up. And then you guys tell me stuff like this. And I'm like, oh, well, fuck. Like, that's really nice. That's like really sweet that you guys actually did stuff like that. Like, I'm glad it helped, though. That's that's uh, you know, now I can now you can put me in credits and the credits of, uh, you know, your next big movie. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, we we get used to doing things our own way we find like something that works so this thing that that you've been doing that seems like normal to you like by you telling me i'm like oh i i've been doing it a different way like now i can take like a little bit of what what you do and then hopefully mm -hmm. like if i if i share a little bit of what i do maybe you could take a little bit of that so yeah just, just... scratch your back you scratch mine <laughs> <laughs> yeah and we we make make better artwork all around um yeah this is something that like i really noticed from you and hearing you talk about it more like is even more so like being a commercial artist where you're following directors versus or you're following like specific direction you have to create this piece for like a really specific need versus being like a true creative experimental artist um and you are on i you're on this end of it where you're like truly experimental and creative and it's it's hard to like kind of tell you what to do um i guess i don't even i don't know it's not really a question it's more of like an observation and um like I, I i don't know i think to to work in certain environments you have to have um a little bit of both of those and i think that's probably something that you you kind of realized and you were like yeah i can't i can't be just like shoved into this into this hole yeah. I have to, I have to do this, do my own, my own thing and take these chances and be, be risky. And, um, and there's definitely like way more risk to doing that, but the reward to that is so much greater because you're going to create something truly unique and, um, beautiful that the world hasn't seen. So yeah, I don't know. It's just just my thoughts, like hearing you hearing you talk about things and like seeing like how you create stuff. And yeah, something that I think about. I think uh, I think uh, in the era that we're in, I think it's the only I think it's the new option that is that is. Um, it just feels like the only best option for us, like. But. Yeah, it's the risk. It's a risk worth willing to take, but but um, I don't. I don't know. I've never seen it that risky. It never felt. It never felt. Uh, felt worth it. You know, it's like if you know your quality is high, if you know you can make high quality work and it's experimental. You know, it. It. I can't see it really. If I've gotten this far. 
and it, and the work looks good. Is it really that experimental? What's not experimental? Do you know what I mean? Like, like, um, yes, there is a difference between commercial work and, well, I don't think there's a difference between commercial work and experimental work. I think it's like whoever decides what is no longer experimental is now commercial. That's the only difference. And so I was like, I don't, I think any, everyone should do that. It's, it's, it's just about being owning up, like think about Alberto Miego, right? Like he, that style was never commercial like 10 years ago, but because his traditional fundamental skills were so high, um, and he was able to make it work with a team and all these things. And, but maybe I don't know about the history of, of how he came to fruition, but it feels like it's experimental until it works. And then people are like, Oh, looks like it works. So I guess it's not experimental anymore. It's like part of, but it's about being a fan first. Like if you're, a, if you really love the craft and you really love the medium, there's no way you can't make a bomb. There's no way that there's failure. Like it's just, I, I just don't see it. Like, I don't see this not working. Like it's just, it has to, because it's, it's, I love it too much. I think for, I love art too much for it to, for it to um, go in a direction that I can't control. Like, like, I don't know. It's just, it just doesn't feel that risky. I think it just sounds risky in on on paper, but in reality, in the market that we're in and the where the where corporations are going and where the world is going, I think being original is something people crave constantly. And by being like a a cog in the machine, you might fade away with those old styles. And by being somebody who <laughs> you're like, <laughs> like as we're not doing you, anything, yeah, like, just, as as the conversation gets like more and more like uh, it, like solemn, like it's like zooms into you, like literally like a cinematic fucking. So um, I don't know. It's it's you die at the end of the story. So why not even try to do what under like it's it's if I'm going to choose art as a career, why? do it any other way is, is yeah. my kind of um, all, either 100 percent or zero percent is yeah. kind of the way i'm thinking about it and yeah it drives you a little crazy sometimes like i do feel like i'm a little like when i do get too experimental or i get too far into drawing and painting or i get too far into art there is like a deep end that you kind of fall into especially with experimental like you get into uh you get into some some deep waters of like your own understanding of reality and stuff like that like you don't get desensitized but you get like oversensitized like you start to look at people and your level of abstraction gets so far down the pipe because you, you're using it all day long to try and reinvent something that you see people and places and things as like like amoebas like there's like amoebas walking around and it just can be really spooky but um that's the only that's the only risk of of I see in in making something new or trying to at least so yeah and it's so important for people today to do something different unique um cuz those those are the only people who are I mean with so with the industry and the state that it's in, like you have to stand out in a way to to be working right now. And I, oh my God. Yeah. Like we we see like every day there's so many like amazing artists like looking for work. Um so yeah, you have to find that unique thing about you and put it into your work and um that's just just being a, a good painter isn't enough anymore no no you have to start your own world like the the era is changing like i don't think people realize we are the generation that makes the future like us young people we are the next in line to be running and owning the businesses and 
and making the new games and the new things. And there's no old guys in front of us that are like going to hire us. We are the people that are supposed to hire the young people now. Right. I think there's people aren't getting it. I don't know if they get it or not, but you are, we are the new leaders for art and its direction and its placement and its, and its perception as it's going along. It's something I realized in the past two years, as I've gotten older and your mortality, your mortality kind of sinks in and you, you know, you get, you get, um, you start to understand a few things about how, how life works and, you know, how nobody really knows what's going on. You know, only people who pretend do get the positions of leadership. So why not actually get good at something? So I know a little bit better than them and run these positions and, and own it, open a studio, do these things. And, you know, the market looks bad because no one wants to start their own thing because it costs a lot of money and it could be risky, but you know, it's, I don't think it's that terrible. Like I think um, it's totally doable. Um, it's all about mindsets and, you know, if, if you're trying to get a concept or job right now and you're like grinding to be this person or that person to get a job, like it's just not going to work, man. Like it's like, I'll give you an example. I know probably a hundred, a hundred people trying to be like Craig Mullins right now, probably more than that. And that guy is, yes, he's one of the greatest grandfathers of concept art or whatever it is. You can't, it's it it it's not optimal to be working that way. Like it's a great starting position, but I think people who groove themselves into that spot or any other artist, they try to become like the next you. Like there's probably a I I can't imagine how many yous you see online. How many you're like, man, this is kind of trying to be a little bit like my style. And yes, uh, imitation to art is flattering. And yes, they got to have a place to start. And yes, they are young and they're they don't know and they're moving and blah blah blah. But it's if you're not trying to be risky or being yourself or being an artist, then it's you're you're gonna fall short because you're because of your fears. Your fears are are what are stopping you from getting to the checkpoint. And it's not even that hard. Like it's it's you'd be surprised how little people are actually making movies. Like you'd think there's like a million people out there trying to direct movies and 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 uh and uh get a crew together and, and and go out and shoot stuff. There's nobody out there. I, I hired a team for free because they're so desperate and looking for people to make movies. They were so desperate in finding a leader to just make something that I was like, okay, I'll do it. And then it, it, it just works. Like it just works. They, they love, I have a producer who, who is amazing. I have a great cinematographer. I have a great roller. I have a great cast. Great. I have the guy from, I have the guy from John Wick. I, I don't even know his name acting in this movie. And he's, he's, he's a Nobuya Shimimoto. Fantastic. And he was so down. Nobody's hiring this guy. Nobody's using them to do these things. Like what the fuck? You, um, you just hit him up like online or something. Yeah, you just find them online. Cause I remember. So, so this is what happened. I, I, uh, I saw his reel. So the Japanese community is very small in Montreal, but we need all Japanese people for our cast because we have Yakuza's. So um, it's actually a really funny film. It's like a dream. It's set in this like thin veil of like a, a suspended dream world where this Yakuza is having a dream where he's looking for this dog with his camaraderies. But but anyways, um, um, and it's I, I got this like crazy location, but uh, um. He, I, I hit him up by email using my, my casting director, which is like a friend of mine that I appointed to casting director and he learned how the role works and stuff like that. And um, he was down. He just said that we needed to make it, uh, uh, this is very interesting. So Montreal needs a unionization in film. They have a unionization called ACTRA. And so your film needs to be registered through that. So what you do is you give up a percentage of your film, like 5% to the actors to convert it to a unionized film. So I gave him 5% and he's like, okay, I'm in, I'm in. And it was, I'm like, dude, no problem. Like this, but it cost me nothing to make this. And it, the quality is amazing. We got a, an amazing camera. 
we got a, this whole lighting system, like a whole lighting setup, like like a professional indie shoot tier of equipment for nothing, for basically nothing. And I'm like, just because there's no work out there, even the discounts they give you, 50, 70%, because these guys can't even sell out equipment because people are too afraid to make something. Either they're too busy texting or being on social media or they're, they're, they've gone digital or they've gone with their phones. The art of making something outside with a group of people, I don't know where it is. It's, it seems like it's dead, but um, especially in a place like Montreal. So it's, it's very fascinating to know that. And uh, yeah. Do you, do you want to hear actually a really funny story? Yeah. I uh, I uh, needed a heavy set guy for our number three. So I I the, there's no dialogue in the entire film. It's all it's all choreographed and the story's told through silence and through movement and and sound and but it's it's I I narratively driven it to be a suspense thriller. So it's a ten minute suspense thriller with no dialogue that shows everything through action. So we use movement and, and all these things to, to portray that um and facial expression and um so we needed this heavy set guy to play our number three and uh we're like my my guys and i were like where are we gonna find this where are we gonna find a big japanese guy like where are we gonna find a big guy and we're, we're spinning our heads and, I'm, and all i said was man it'd be cool like i just need someone who's like a sumo wrestler and then we our heads literally like an alarm went off we're like ding 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 and we're like, man, let's go to a sumo wrestling academy. Let's go to a sumo wrestling place and recruit, find a sumo wrestler who's not an actor and just talk him into it. And so I, I found a sumo wrestling place in Montreal, drove to the sumo wrestling academy. And uh, it's called Sumo Something Montreal. And uh, I went in there. It was like a Friday at like six. And you see these huge guys like, whoosh. And doing their like their whole stance and everything, like even like white guys doing sumo wrestling, it's like the funniest thing in the world. And they're and they're doing all this movement, and I come in and I'm like so little, like uh, I'm not that little, I'm like six feet. But these guys are like six, six. These are like big guys, and I'm like, uh, I'm here to uh, shoot a movie, and uh, you know, this might sound kind of weird, but I'm looking for like a big Japanese guy. They're like, dude, we have the fucking guy for you. And we, this guy, this huge Japanese guy I'm talking to, Seda, and he, I shook his hand. Dude, I swear to God, his hand was like, like two of mine. It like ate my hand. And I'm telling him about this movie and he's like, he's like, yeah, it sounds great, blah, blah, blah. But why don't you, uh, you know, try the art of sumo since you're here? Bro, it was the most fun experience. I put on the the, the gear and, and everything and I'm practicing the movements. These guys beat my ass. But it was so much fun. And this place takes place in a, it's a pseudo sumo wrestling uh, practice, but it takes place in a jujitsu gym. So it was perfect for, you know, I was able to make conversations about jujitsu and all these things. So it was really nice to like find that community there as well for that. And it was such a crazy experience. Like those guys were so big, like freakishly huge, but so kind, so incredibly kind. But hilarious that's crazy dude i'm so glad you're doing this this is gonna inspire a lot of people to just go out and make a movie or something yeah it's in the air right now i feel i have i hear a lot of concept artists talk about making their own projects and movies and stuff like that um mm. so i wonder if it's like a zeitgeist thing like they see the in, they see the market where it's going and they're they're just deciding to do their own thing but i don't know um do you what do you think about because i have my own view on this but i'm curious what you think um do you think you should what, what should you do with your 20s is that the time to like put your head down and just like focus on your career get like super good at this one thing and kind of set yourself up for the rest of your life or do you think there should be a more balanced approach where you um, you work, but you really enjoy your twenties as well. Um, what what is your thought on that? Um, it depends on what you're doing, right? Like, mm -hmm. it depends on who you are. So every person is different. 
every individual has their own different reasons for why they do something. But putting their head down for art, I enjoyed my 20s. I didn't really grind too hard. I painted a lot, but because I wanted to. So it didn't feel like I was putting my head down. I never felt in my life like I had to put my head down um, unless it was for a job I didn't like. Um, it depends, like, how bad do you want that job? Do you love that career? If so, then you're not putting your head down. You're doing something you love, right? But if it's something you really want to do, but you don't like the process of it and you're putting your head down, then why are you doing it? So I don't think you should have to do that. I don't think life is like grind, 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 grind. And you have to, I got to study. I can't go out. I, I can't, I can't, I got to study. I got to study. I got to study. Your work is going to show that your work is going to be stiff. It's going to be, it's going to be gross. It's going to be underdeveloped. It's going to be tasteless. It's going to be good art is a, is from a live the life that's been lived. Like you'll see it in the artwork when somebody's lived a specific way, when someone's been a certain way, you can see it in the way that they express, you know, a good example. Like, you know, if your life is like this, your art will be like this. If your life is like this, your art will be like this. So by keeping your head down, you're 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 like doing that, I think. But you know, again, then it depends on what you're making and what you're trying to do. And if you're trying to be an artist, then it doesn't feel like this. It feels like this and like this. So I enjoyed my 20s. Um I, I know a lot of fundamental, I hope to think that I know the fundamentals of drawing painting at a decent level, but I did it because I loved it. I didn't do it because I had to keep my head down. So it's, I would say, don't keep your head down. I think you shouldn't have to. The idea of keeping your head down means you don't like, like that, you know, but again, It does require a lot of hard work to get good at something. And if you love it, then you're going to need to keep your head down a while. So depends how good do you want to get? Like, <laughs> like if you want to get really good, you're going to keep your head down, man. Like, but you got to learn to love it down there. You got to get your little water bottle. You got to get your, your little snacks. And uh, you know, it's funny. It reminds me of like, when you were talking to Alex, Alex Mandrage of like, you guys were talking about where you would have hours and hours of, time where you would just lock yourselves in your room with like nothing to eat just maybe a snack you would go and like make food that you made in like five minutes just so that you can come back here and do this fucking thing and i relate to that so hard i've spent dude like hours and hours and hours and hours. i can't even i can't even tell you how many thousands of paintings i've made that aren't even upload that aren't even like made or whatever it is like there's there's so many thumbnails like so many paintings so many fuck ups so many like weird ideas that didn't work or like just or great paintings that i just pushed too far that i just had to delete and uh god hundreds and hundreds so yeah i guess you know what is your goal that's the only option really right like if your goal is to be enough to get a job you don't have to keep your head down. Enjoy your 20s. Have fun. Go do whatever you want. If you love art and you want to be somebody and you want to have an impact or you want to create something beautiful, you got to keep your head down. Um, that's kind of it. Yeah, so that's my... What do you think? Yeah, it's a difficult question. It's something that people have been asking me. That's why I wanted to bring it up to you because um, I think everyone is different. For me, I had to like cut everyone out of my life and just like focus on this thing and just be like hyper focused for a few years and just get get really good. And then um you know, like I had to do that. I had to get to the to a certain level so that I could get jobs and then you know, so it was worth that sacrifice in my early twenties to to get there. And then um, so I tend to tell people like you, 
you have to do that. You have to make some sacrifices in the beginning. Um, you know, you can w- imagine the feeling when you don't, when you've accomplished, you've worked a few years really hard and, um, now you're, you're kind of comfortable in, in this career that you've, um, you've got to, and now you don't have to worry about that anymore. And now you can do all the, all the things that maybe you feel like you missed out on or something. Like I never got to travel like my whole life. Like the first time, like really leaving the country and stuff has been in the past like few years. Uh, so, um, and, um, yeah, and it's like because I put in, I sacrificed earlier on. Now I can, I can enjoy and chill. And I think I see a lot of people not willing to do that. And five years will go by, seven years will go by, I'll, I'll of me knowing them, and they're kind of in the same kind of spot. And I want to like shake them, I'm like dude just i know dude i know i know i know like you're so you're you're like you're like this close to like live in the dream it's probably like six months maybe a year you gotta just like uh you just gotta get focused and do it and they don't they don't do it they don't they can't sacrifice like the like the work-life balance for for a little bit you know Dude, and then they hate you when you bring it up. They they're like, uh, like, why you gotta tell me what to do? Like, yeah, just work life balance. I just don't believe in you know sacrifice, dude. It's just because they don't love it that much. They don't love it as much as we love it. But also something I've heard recently that resonates true is we people who have high aspirating goals or like really want to be somebody live on like a different timeline. Like we we have urgency. Mm-hmm. Like there's like a level of urgency in our lives. Like Every day you have to do something. You know time is moving forward. You're mad. You could. You're like, you should. You got to do this so you could be free earlier, so you don't have to do it late. Like you don't have to be pinned down later. But people, they move like molasses. It feels like they're in a different, like wavelength of time. Like they're, it looks like they're in slow motion with their with their choices and their their ideas. But I, the truth is, I think they just don't love it that much. They don't love it as much as we love it. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Which is weird because the those same people will will complain, um, and then they'll they'll be like taking classes and and stuff like this. So it's yeah, it's kind of confusing. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you're right. They they just they just don't love it enough. Because if you love it enough, you will you will be like, no, I'm not gonna um uh you know hang out with my friends uh every day i'm gonna you know say no to a few things and make time for this yeah yeah well you go you go hang out with my friends i could be painting right now that's what they do that's what people who want to be good at art they go you want me to hang out are you crazy do you know the idea i have right now i have to go put it down sometimes it's like hanging out what that's crazy like i i don't want to do any of that i'm like i want to go and make something awesome i'm like i'll hang out with you later but with most people it's the other way around they'd rather sacrifice the you know the um the the art for and it just shows what they care about more it's not it's it's okay but your confusion also with with them like taking classes and complaining it's like uh, people are flawed. Like I think they, you know, it's like asking why someone runs their head into the wall. It's like, you know, it complements their decision-making. Like like they chose this career that they don't love that much. So of course they're going to, you know, make a decision that's very similar to that with their other things and complain about it. It's, it's a self-awareness thing. I think it's like a, it's like a, they just don't see the big picture they see on these little individual small scales, like they go to a class and they're like, they're like horse blinders. They're like, oh man, my, my teacher's got me doing 10 painting this week. It's like, I don't want to do that. Like, oh, like, ah, oh. but it's like, 
what you chose to go there you chose to choose this, this is your life you die at the end like you chose to go to this class that you really like to do and now you hate it it's painting class it's not even that hard like it's drawing and painting and so it's it's you know it's it's their decision making alone is not surprising when they complain because their inherent decision to choose a job like painting and not commit to it is a telltale sign that they'll complain about things. But it's, it's, it is weird. It is very weird. I'm still figuring out why I know people who take career paths in the, in the industry, like gamer art and, and they don't, work hard at it or they don't they don't love it like it's but they chose it i don't it's it's but people have different things that they value like some people value family and 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 their friends and their relationships and their tv shows that they really like or whatever it is and their job is something very very down on the priorities list but with a job like art it can't be it, it really can't be that low down. You, you're going to really fuck yourself later. Like you're going to be working as an accountant when you're like 35 and they have no idea. They have no clue either that, or you'll be, I don't know what they'll be doing, but it won't be art. That's for sure. With the yeah. level of times that I see. And I'm like, dude, you've been doing this for how many years? How many people, you know, have been doing it for like 10 plus years. And you're like, Whoa, what are you doing? This is crazy. And nobody's told them. No one's ever said anything on how to how to adjust their paintings or fix them. Or people have said things to them where they go, "Man, I think you need to fix your values. I think your compositional, I think your your value ranges are really bad. I think you're not focusing enough on your subject and X, Y, Z, and the other, or your anatomy sucks or whatever it is." Nobody's told them. And then when they do, they get like super angry. They go like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, I get it." They'll go, yeah, 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 okay, 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 okay. And they sh they shrivel away or they go somewhere else or where they go where they're comfortable. And, you know, it's, 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 it's I think it's in every industry, but yeah, art, it's very spooky. You're like, what are you, what are you doing here? It's like, what? Yeah. Yeah. It, it kind of drives me a little crazy when um, artists, they, they get the job and then that that's it. They, they don't grow as an artist at all. They just completely, it just, art is just a job now. Um, and you know, like the, the new people coming up are, um, are looking, they're taking in everything that all the current artists are doing. They're bringing their own tools and, um, new, new things to to art so um like though if you're not continually growing pushing yourself a little bit then you'll be replaced i think um and yeah it's been it's been frustrating i've been at a at a couple of places and i'll work with someone um and they've been in the industry like 20 years or something and i'm but for me, it's like 10 years and, um, they, they don't understand perspective at all. And they're like, they're an environment painter. Um, and then they ask me to like paint over and like show them. So I'm like trying to teach this person perspective and then I, I give them the drawovers and then they send it back to me and they just, they take my perspective drawing and then they just flatten everything again. I'm like, it's like. In one year, out the other. Yeah. <laughs> I just spent two hours like creating this like lesson for you on perspective and doing these drawings for you. And then you just like, you just don't even, you don't even take it. I'm like, ah. Oh. The best is when they go, whoa, yeah. Like during the whole thing, they'll be like, yo, yeah. Like that's, they're like, okay, okay. And they're like making notes or whatever. I, I've been in the exact same position. They go mm -hmm. like, yeah oh okay cool 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 and then and then the next day when it's like stand-ups or like critiques or whatever it is it's a back to old business you're like you just just it's like one ear out the other you're like dude i'm giving you gold like i'm giving you i'm giving you gold on a platter 
yeah. and you I don't know it's but yeah I've been there dude it really really sucks like and and how do they even get hired how do they even make it this far sometimes I'm like how did you get all the way over here I don't know yeah yeah I, I have no idea it boggles my mind I was like dude I've seen seniors dude bro I've seen seniors that will that would make people on deviant art look like gods like make make that would make beginners look on i'm like where did you come from i'm like i think it has something to do with either they 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 come up with the industry like they started as like another position like usually like a t a tech and then from a tech they'll work their way into the art part of the industry so they'll somehow zigzag their way in but or they came in very early before things like got gentrified or before things got like reworked, you know, when like they, they bring in a new art director, then they fire the whole team and they rehire everyone. So people like linger, they'll go on vacation, be in that, be in the back burner and then they'll come in and you'll see them and you'll be like, what the fuck is this? Who are you? <laughs> like what? But it, what's crazy is they're responsible for a lot of bad work too. Like it's it, it, sometimes like it's we sound like we're being mean i think but i think we just care about the industry and like care about what a person wants to see and watch and do and a concept artist is a very crucial part of the process and when it's someone who doesn't care like clearly they don't care is being in a very very specific role that could potentially create the output of this final product and you're like shitting the bed it's like you're ruining the, the 3D artist job. The guy's got to render everything out. The post-processing, like like this entire pipeline that has to deal with this work. It's like, you know, it's it's frustrating. And then it's dealing with your time. You had to take so much time to teach this guy perspective, the very basic foundation that you could even, like it takes like a week to learn decent perspective. I'm like, it doesn't, it's not rocket science. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the thing. It's I'm not saying it to be mean. It's it's like I care so much about this and like I put in the time to learn these things. Um yeah. I'm passionate about it. So Yeah, and I think the worst is when it's like a a production designer that's like kind of failed his way up um or someone who's um it and not not that every production designer has to be like an incredible artist um and some of the some of the best production designers they're just really good at putting together a team and letting them do their thing um but it's like when a production designer isn't a painter but then they're painting over your um your color keys or something um and they dis they destroy like the the like the value structure and the like the beautiful colors that you put in there. Um yeah. and you just oh. make it garish and and horrible. Um that yeah, to me that's like when I need to leave a project. That's soul crushing. That's soul crushing. Yeah. Ooh, like it's like because a, a a decent person would realize like I know. I feel like I know what my flaws are and I, I like to hire people or work with people who are much better than me at these things. So I'm like, yeah, I trust you to, to do that thing. And I respect like your, your vision. Um, like I don't, I don't need to like put my, my hand on everything. That's like you going to the 3d modeler and being like, no, 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 no. Like, hold on, hold on, hold on. And then like extruding everything out and moving the poly around and like making the character huge and like, oh, oh, oh. And then giving it back to him and being like, this is what you should do, dude. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's insane. There's some, it's, a, it's, uh, the industry is so insane. Like, unless you're at like, unless you're like a senior or you're higher up or like you're, or you're on a good project, like, I think that's the only time I'll, I'll come back is if it's a good project with a good team. Other than that, I've gotten so jaded 
from just just these really bad it's either like a real i always get on a project that's like a really bad idea or it's un it's it's like not thought through at all and it's built along the way like it's like it's built with hiccups like they don't even have an idea it's just like everything's thrown together every day every day is like a new way to make this thing and it's there's no path mm -hmm. that's super frustrating or it's weird stuff like that where like there's like a either it's the guy who paints over everything or somebody who has like a real ego you know what i mean like a real um i'm the boss guy like I, you listen like you we're going to make it my way or the highway guy is like, I can't, I can't do it. Yeah. I can't do it too brutal. But the, I I do believe there are good projects out there and there's a, and there are great teams. Like what I'm dying to know is who worked on Jacent. Like who was the lead for Jacent? Like that was crazy. What is it? Jacent, like J-U-S-A-N-T. I don't know that. Unbel the work that Andre did was unbelievable i was like my eyes are melting i was like this is crazy stuff they let him go right off the rails like right off the rails and he made some of the most beautiful and they they took all of his designs and made the entire game from it i think they used i don't know what program they used they used unity but they modeled everything in uh i think i don't know if they did it straight unity but there are some things that are a little bit lackluster with the rendering like the post-processing and you could tell that the 3D modelers weren't on the same level as Andre, but some of the beautiful work that came out of there, they let that guy just, they're like, here, here's the idea. Here's what we need. Go. And no holds bars. I don't think that guy got a single piece of criticism. I think they just probably told him, okay, got, they guided him a little bit like towards what they needed, but Wow, 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 wow. That's a perfect example. Of, that is the perfect example of we have this idea for a project. Who's the artist that we need for this that we think is available? This guy. Get him. Get these people. Like projects that are accordingly associated to people who are perfect for the role should be hired, not just because they're talented or whatever it is, right? Like it's it's a foundational fundamental that I think people need to understand, especially um, art directors that are looking for people that are finding people for the roles. Like sometimes they get become fans and they go, this guy is, just has awesome work and he doesn't suit the vision at all. Even though he's super talented, it just doesn't like a game or a film is like a, is like a unit. Like it's like a single unit and the whole team has to contribute to that single vision. And I feel like when one or two people are just out of place, the product kind of will fall apart. Like I, I remember I used to be obsessed with watching behind the scenes on how games are made. Like a, like document, I would watch like video game documentaries on how Halo 2 and Halo 1 and Combat Evolved were made and uh, well, sorry, Halo Combat Evolved and how Halo 2 were made and how Halo 3 was made and the entire behind the scenes and they spoke to every single like tech developer and from the tech side and the technical director to the art director to the concept artist to the sound guys and hearing every single one of them they were a cohesive unit that all made the work for that like that all made work similar to that game before they even got on there they were just the guy they were like the halo guy for every department I mean, it was insane. Like, uh, but those were like real uh, basement dwelling artists. Like, you know what I'm talking about? Like the real, the real guy, the guys who really don't go outside. Yeah. <laughs> those guys are insane. Yeah. Like Aran Shia is like, that guy's in, that guy is not so good. Yeah. Uh, they feel like an alien. You ever see a live video of him painting? He does kind of look like an alien. He does kind of remind me of like an alien. He's so, he's so, I would love to meet him. He is one of my idols. But uh, like, remember, I don't know if you've ever done it back in the day, like him and Theo Prince and all the other Guild Wars are like just going through the gallery and zooming in as close as possible. And you see like every pics, every line is, I was like, dude, 
even when I used to do Rajya studies in like 2013, I would like try to do every little piece of rendering and I would give up after like two or three hours because I'm like, this hurts, my hand, my hands hurt. Yeah. Oh my God. Wow. Um, cool. I have, I have a few more questions. Um, what's your best advice for artists starting out? Um, okay, I have two answers. One is, depending on who you want to be, do micro versions of that. So like, let's say you want to be um, an animator or a concept artist, um, whatever it is. Have the goal be high, but every day it's quantity. So it's small. It's like you... If you want to be like, let's say a keyframe artist, do a thousand thumbnails, do thumbnails, 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 straight from the dome. Don't look at anything straight from your imagination. Maybe a couple of references, whatever it is, just bang out thumbnails as much as possible. Same with an animator, make so many animations, like keep them short though, but always finish them. Always finish your work. Always take it to the end. Never, never take it like 60% and give up or leave a background open or leave a white space. From beginning to end, maybe set a timer, 30 minutes. Let me get it to this spot. 30 minutes of, for three thumbnails, 10 minutes each. Same thing with, with a full concept, you know, or a character piece. Do five rotations, do five objects. Just keep the goal small. If you set your goal too big, like I want to make a huge ass concept piece and your fundamentals aren't sound, the piece is going to look like shit and it's not sound. You didn't learn anything. But with a thumbnail, it'll be bad. The first couple 100 will suck. But at least you're 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 finishing them. You're building them. The readability is getting there. You could they're, they're, you're you're tackling so many more fundamentals to a completed state as opposed to just trying to do this big painting that that takes forever. It's it's the number one problem I see with artists is at the beginning stages is they they try to bang out these epics that are like so heavily drawn and so you can feel the pain in them when you look at them like you they look so painful to make and they're so stiff and ugly and muddy and 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 just uh, and just naive but like with thumbnails you can go wild um also that being said in your thumbnails, in your small little pockets of work, try to push it, push it as far as possible. Like make them crazy, have ideas that don't make sense. Follow the vision, write something down beside it. Listen to a specific piece of music or sound and try it. Just go nuts. You have your 10 minutes. The only goal is to finish it and whatever, make a goal beside it. Put It should be readable today. Today is readability day. Make them all readable, right? But because the pressure is so low on making thumbnails, you're more inclined to make them as opposed to something that is so big to have to take on. It's like even playing sports. Like, you don't, before you even go on the golf course, you have to go to the range every day for like a month to even practice your swing. You're not playing a full 18 the first game. You're not going to learn anything. You're going to hit it into the ditch. You're going to hit it into the water. And you're going to be there all day. You're going to get frustrated and you're going to leave thinking that that's what golf is when it isn't. So, you know, it's all about practice on a smaller scale and then gradually making it bigger and bigger and bigger as you go along. It's it's like making music, composing, any, it's like everything. Like you don't just jump into the, I mean, you can, but you're going to drown. You don't just jump into the lake. You got to swim in a pool. Let your dad push you in. Figure it out. But uh, yeah, that's my advice. That's yeah, my, that's, my that's awesome. I love like if I could go back, I would have just not tried to make illustrations. I would have just done thousands of studies earlier. But if I could do that, like in in high school, like I could have <laughs> could have been a concept artist at like eighteen. I know, dude. I know. Oh my god, I started I started doing that way too late. Like. Actually, maybe not too bad, but 
but yeah, once you figure it out, once you figure out how to get, how to like grind correctly, I guess, or work it correctly, you'll, you learn so much faster. I could tell you've been doing thumbnails a long time, long time. It's in your readability. Like you're, you're so loose and it's so expressive, but I could tell they start really, really small. Like they've started really small because of how strong the sources are from where they expand from. But uh, the abstractions are nice. And, and you can tell you take that thumbnail to a bigger canvas and then you rework it and rebuild it and it gets bigger and bigger. And bigger. But classic, yeah. classic. Mm -hmm. move. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I like having like, like a page full of paintings. I'm like working on all of them, like really tiny. Mm -hmm. And then, and then when a couple of them are starting to look good, I, I blow them up or I zoom into them and I go from there. Um, it's writing is the same way writing is the exact same way you hmm. you shit out an idea on a piece of paper write like 10 and then you go oh this one's the best or these two are the best let's make them bigger like paintings and you just move them on and you make a full script out of it oh that's awesome Maybe. um goals for the future so finishing your short and whatever do you, what else do you have like um long-term goals yeah um the only long-term goal i have right now is make a feature and uh bring back uh a certain type of filmmaking that got lost in the early 2000s so um i want to bring back it sounds so fucking narc to even say this but i want to bring back good movies like i want to I want to I want to bring suspense thrillers back. I want to bring them back in in a way that is reinventive and modern again and keep people excited and put people back in theater seats. I think that's my goal. Like I really I really believe I truly believe I can make a great feature film that can make people excited about seeing movies in a different way again. Like how we used to see them in the 90s or the early 2000s and, and like a, something different but follows the fundamental aspects of good filmmaking like Sidney Lumet's fundamental film booking guide like he he it's the, it's the approach where it's like it's um sorry I lost my words a little bit there um it's creating the orchestrated feeling of being to create emotion and rises and falls and, and not living in this, in this line of irony that movies are kind of made today with, um, but in a sense of seriousness or, or like uh, in a contemporary excelment, like where, where you're watching this, where you're watching a film and you just, you're like, wow, I've never seen this before, but this is making me feel all these types of ways and it's universal and it hits everybody's notes like you, you get the guy the average movie goer then you get like someone who's at a, another higher level like the experience of when you went to go and watch the matrix for the first time that's the experience i've always wanted to give somebody that it, just that just that's that's my dream right there is you go to the movies you're sitting in a theater seat you're on a ride for the entire thing you leave and you go what i don't even know what that was but that was amazing. That made me feel that that put me through a thing, and it and it and it and it carries on for years. And it maybe it ages like wine, maybe it doesn't. But the feeling of having a finished feature film that went my way, that resonates, is the goal. That's a big goal. But it, it's it's. I have to start with short films first, and I have to work my way and focus on those and just like painting like these are my thumbnails like I have to really nail these and really make sure that they're perfect and I learn about the process and what it is to be on a set and how it moves and how people move and what motion is like and what's in between the lines of editing and what's in between uh, ideas and and subtext and conveying subtext and rhythm and pacing and timing and, and all these other things nailing that and feeling it and then moving on and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But I just know, you know, when you just know, you're like, it, it, 
was just like, it was the same feeling with painting. I knew it was going to get ish to something, but I didn't know it was going to look like this, but it gets to a level. It's like that with film now. It feels it feels like the correct evolution. Like everything I learned is leading into these moments, like, like a ramp. And now we're like ramping up. So it's um it's exciting, but it's also very, very scary because um it's very stressful to deal with lots of people and schedules and stuff like that and reliability, but but it's worth it. It's 100%. I, I, when I finished that first time on set and I got onto this one, I, the feeling you get is like no other. It's like, it's just right. You get there and you're like this, this, my body is telling me this is the most right thing I should be doing and nothing else. And sometimes it's hard because you, I had this whole life in painting, but it's, it's starting to kind of run dry but it's at a point where it's starting to also get the most exciting. Like it's, it's really weird. Like I'm, it's time for me to move on and do this thing, but I feel like I'll always just paint anyways for myself. But these, these projects are uh, way more artistically fulfilling. It's like a hunger. Like they, painting doesn't fill it enough. Like it, my belly is still, my art belly is really full so or it's really hungry. So that's kind of that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah. What's your long term? My long term goal, just to be the best possible painter that I can be. Um, yeah, it's it's simple, but it helps me to guide my life in a way. Um, every job I take, I ask myself, is this gonna make me a better painter? Um, if not, then I take the other job or um... <laughs> that's so beautiful <laughs> that's so simple and beautiful <laughs> god i wish god i wish oh my god that is amazing um... that's very it's very like i have one simple goal it's like very mi japanese minimalism like i have one simple goal to be a painter not only a, ba a painter the greatest painter that I can be. And then you like, you like do this, you like uh, put your hands in your sleeves and you like walk away. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it might change, but we'll, we'll see. Um, yeah. Yeah, you'll cross the road when you get there. Yeah. Um, any predictions for the future of entertainment? yeah oh my god um the we are like in a very interesting time you're going to see i feel now i feel like a wizard you will see a change a broad change um you're gonna see a big change and it always changes but Man, it is the end, the end for um, major st studios in the next 10 years. It's such a big call. It's, I'm telling you, it's such a, a hot take, but in seven or eight years, you won't see uh, major studios doing it anymore. Everything is becoming independent. Like, it's it's like bubbles like they these companies get really big and then they pop and then these smaller bubbles that are around get big like it's the rise of indie like you're going to see the death of AAA so th this next 10 years is the death of AAA studios Ubisoft EA Unity uh whatever it is bye bye say goodbye that's all that's all old news that's all old bungee shit like that's it's goodbye you're going to see smaller studios that make successful titles become these new AAA studios. So you're going to see like end night, right. Or whatever it is like growing in, or they'll be acquisited by, you know, um, you know, what's delaying it is the acquisitions from, from bigger companies like Epic or whatever it is, but you're going to see a, um, some really big Titans fall and some smaller companies come in and you're going to see almost like, um, 
think of it like a rebellion like a political rebellion like you know like like the it's this is going to be a little dark but like the the al-qaeda in afghanistan or like um you know isis forming as a bubble when one group gets destroyed another bubble grows it's like that in entertainment the exact same way nobody wants to put up with these really shit games or crappy titles or whatever it is nobody wants to play assassin's creed 100 nobody cares nobody cares about odyssey 10 like uh, nobody gives a shit people want something new refreshing and interesting and so they're not going to play these old games they're going to play fun indie stuff they're going to see on steam and they're going to play uh well when the video remix comes in everyone's going to play old games again but like you're going to see uh dynamic titles that introduce new genres kind of take over and then you're from there um you're going to see a repopulation of concept artists again or whatever it is, but it's hard to say with AI, like that's going to take away a lot, especially with Sora. Um, as someone who knows how to use AI pretty well, um, I use it to make references sometimes and it's really good. It's really interesting, but it's definitely going to make some really crazy stuff. Uh, for the future of games it's kind of like you know what i noticed it's like a calculator for a mathematician like the more you understand about art and its fundamentals and in the world about in that you kind of like can do some pretty wacky and crazy stuff with it but uh you know that's for another time but but um yeah it's not good it's not good for most but if you're on top of the heap and you're you have visions you win because that's all that matters. Like as long as you have great ideas, that's all that matters. And you, and you follow the tools and the programs and you stay up to date with tech, you'll be fine. You've ride the wave. If you ride the wave, you're good. If you don't ride the wave, you'll fall underneath it and be swept away. Especially all you anti AI heads out there. You better, you better, you gotta be careful, bro. But um, it's definitely getting interesting, but in a good way. Uh, you're you're going to see a lot of mediocrity die. A lot of average mediocrity. It won't survive. It just can't survive in the, in the market like that. Um, especially things that are ripoffs of other things. You're, you're, they won't live very long. Um, But yeah, it's going to be very, very different in like six or seven years, something like that. Hmm. But yeah, that's my, that's my call. That's my call. But different in the landscape, but the ideas of pursuit are, have always been the same. But I think people just get freaked out about tech, but it's been this, it's, it's not any different than when I think the camera came out for photography for when, uh, you know, digital painting came out for illustrators that were working in the industry. Like it's, it's, it's intense and it's, it's fast and it's a lot, but I don't know. It's not that scary. Like I, for some reason it never really, I just learned how to use it and just figured it out and just spent time practicing around and fucking around with it. I guess if you have an experimental head, like you just do stuff like you just don't care about tech and you just mess around with everything. But to, not bad at all. It made stuff a lot easier to do. Um, and, you know, nothing can take away your visions, right? They're yours. If you let the tech take it away, you lose. But if you use the tech to support your vision, you still win. So I don't see the, you know, I don't see the, the, the problem. But, but anyways, yeah, that's my take. Yeah. Sorry, it was like a long rant. My bad. <laughs> No, that's that's great. Um, yeah, it'll be very interesting to see what happens. Um, I think there's gonna be a lot of like complete trash that's gonna be made um, in the next few years. Like stuff that's like people are trying to create everything with AI. Um, okay. It's already they're like, happened. They're like, oh, we can make, uh, we can get rid of our art team and make. Um, just just use AI um, 
and uh yeah so that'll that'll be interesting to see and then they'll the, they'll come back to the <laughs> artists <laughs> it doesn't work you need us like they, yeah. it doesn't work because it only it's exactly like a calculator like it for a mathematician it, it doesn't work unless you understand the basic principles of design and because yeah it can make anything beautiful but you're making joe schmo's next thing down the street it doesn't matter like people get so bent out of shape about it it's like it's ripping off this artist and this art and this artist actually if you train it on your own diffusion model and you use your own artwork you can really reinvent the wheel with your stuff so it it doesn't it, it doesn't have to be that way but the people who are doing that are making unoriginal work and you kind of miss the point of art in the first place which is to you take it to a new place you're always evolving you're always making something new yeah it took some guy's old style of shit but that guy's probably doing something completely different now. He's probably on to something else. And he maybe even looked at it and was like, hey, that's pretty cool. That's an interesting idea. Let me take it somewhere else. Like, I think it's people who are insecure about their own work, maybe, or they're just insecure about the process, or they're afraid that they're not as smart as a machine or smart, or or they think that it, that it's like, it's an intelligent creature that's going to take you away from something instead of this, instead of this calculator or whatever it is. Like, it's just... Personally, I don't get it, but I don't get into the politics of it online. I, maybe this might get me in trouble, but whatever. Um, but yeah, it's it's you're going to see so much generic shit, but it's exactly like how it's always been. We've always seen generic shit forever, and it's always those diamonds that stick out of the rough. And if anything, it makes you shine even more when you make original work. So it's, you know. But I don't know. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. Uh, last question. Can you tell us anything about your Gumroad tutorial that you're making? No, no, yeah, I can. Uh, it's, <laughs> look at that smile, smile from Green to Green. Um, <laughs> yes, I can. Uh, it's about vision and things that we kind of covered. So alternative ways to explore the image in your mind or an idea that you have to add dimension to it. So using sound or let's say you're uninspired, you don't know what to make. So and you're watching a show or you're watching a movie or you're whatever. How do you take unrelated sequences and make them related and build something from that? And it's good for it's more of a theory gumroad which I don't think I've ever seen before. And so this is specifically for intermediate to advanced. It's some people who already know a bit of the fundamentals and can riff with it. And uh, the reason why I'm doing that is because I've personally never seen something that challenges something new with concept, especially using outside mediums to bring in. And I think it'd make a great dent in creating new artwork for video games and film that and make subgenres out of. Like I think for video games especially, there's just a lack of subgenre. Like there's no there's a lot of like fake deep games out there or like simulator or walking simulators or whatever. But I feel like there's there's no real tutorial to nuance out there. There's always like how to do a, how to make a composition this way, how to draw in value and how to paint in color and light. And it's all the same. I've seen a hundred how to do values paintings and it's all the it's the history's already out. The, the knowledge is already out there for everything. Why not we make something that is an idea that we can try and push something a little further? So I'm making the video on that. It's tough because I'm challenging my own ideas of art to try and understand something. And so I'm constantly, what I would do is I'd, I'd get to a point where I, I get it where I'm like, okay, this, this part I've rationalized in my head on how to create a vision, but then I run into a wall where I've never articulated it with my mouth or with typing or words. And then I have to work it out. And then I, and then I go back to the video and I add to it. And then I, and then I, make it cohesive and I sew it all together. And it's interesting because I never want to create something for somebody that doesn't make sense or that doesn't 
um, isn't relatable or isn't, um, or they can't understand it, or they're just like, this is too wishy-washy. Like, I want something that is incredibly structured, cohesive, and something you could try that that day. And it doesn't require a lot of work. So that's kind of the point of it. And also I included a, a, a speed painting, a one hour speed painting and uh, uh, overlaid with um, some dialogue of how the idea that came to the painting and what I thought about and what's interested me about it and, and why I chose certain uh, compositional choices and the brushes that I'm using and types of matting choices and how I get certain effects, et cetera. So that's, that's basically, that's the gumroad. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Um, yeah, that's something that, that I was, or, and still am like searching for, um, just, you know, yeah. So it's gonna be great. And, um, I'll, I'll post links to, to all of that too. So everyone can find it. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Hell yeah. But cool, will, man. anything um, else it'll be released on was it tuesday before friday so before oh, friday great cool um dude thank you so much um it's great talking to you um yeah i always i always learn so much from um from your your insights and following your work so Thank you. Tear, tear coming down my eyes. That's so beautiful. <laughs> Dude, I learned from you. That's so crazy. Mm -hmm. I remember the first day you followed me and I showed all my friends and being like, who's the big shot now, buddy? Who's the big shot now? <laughs> Dude, I couldn't, I still can't believe it. I was so, this whole day I was like, I'm talking to Zach, I'm talking to Zach. <laughs> but Turned out to be completely fine. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're you're super funny and entertaining, and man, the stuff you're gonna make, I I can't wait. Like I I was excited before, but like after like talking to you and like getting into your head a little bit, like yeah, I can't wait to see the short film and the next stuff you make. It's gonna be epic. Thank you, sir. Thanks. I'm yeah. very excited. And if you need a concept artist someday, you know, you know who to hire. Give me a give me a shot. That's why I did this. I'm actually hiring you for my next. Uh, this is actually an interview. Oh. <laughs> I'll I'll hear from HR. Uh, for, for <laughs> my sure. my my people will contact your people. Yeah, yeah. sounds good. <laughs> All right, my man. Cool. Have a great night, and um, yeah, keep in touch, and um, we'll talk soon. I shall. I shall. See you, buddy. See ya. <laughs>